narcotic drugs. It was made public about two weeks ago, and a House Government Reform Subcommittee reviews the plan in this nearly three-hour hearing. and I thank you all for coming. We've been looking forward for some time now to the release of the synthetic drug <coughs> control strategy, which was finally unveiled on June 1st. Today we will hear from several witnesses as to the strengths and weaknesses of this plan. With the near universal recognition that methamphetamine addiction has become an epidemic, it is imperative that the federal government provide the best possible leadership and vision on this pressing social and law enforcement problem. State and local governments, as well as many private agencies devoted to helping families and communities cope with this scourge, have long complained that no matter how diligent non-federal actors have been or could be, nothing can fill the void of national direction. Only federal leadership will suffice, suffice and many have awaited the new strategy with only guarded optimism. There seem to be ample reason for concern as to the administration's commitment to a mess strategy. We can hardly forget a key presentation at the HHS-sponsored conference in Utah last August 19th, which said, quote, we don't need a war on methamphetamine. Nor can we forget, as the New York Times reported on December 15th, that FDA was working behind the scenes to block the Combat Meth Act. This strategy sets three primary goals. One, a 15% reduction in methamphetamine abuse. Two, a 15% reduction in prescription drug abuse. And three, a 25% reduction in domestic methamphetamine laboratories. The strategy itself concedes that the first two goals may be met without much change in the federal response, given that recent trends already may be moving in that direction. The third goal is likely to be achieved due to tough restrictions on precursor chemicals set out first by most of the states and now by Congress through the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act, enacted this spring with virtually no support and even some opposition from the administration. With the national standard for precursor chemical control soon to be in full effect through the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act, hopes are high for significant declines in domestic meth production but meth will remain readily available unless international diversion of precursor chemicals can be stopped. This is borne out by the increased smuggling of meth across the southwest border as Mexican drug traffickers move to exploit the decline in domestic meth production. Accordingly, the strategy begins with its international aspect, laying out three prongs, one, attaining better information about international trade in pseudofedrin, two, swift and effective implementation of the Combat Meth Act, and three, continued law enforcement and border activities and continued partnership with Mexico. Regarding the first prong, the administration has been taking some positive steps and recognizes that the problem cannot be tackled until its international nature and scope is fully understood. The challenge begins with this hopeful fact. The main precursor chemical, pseudoephedrine PSE, is produced in a handful of countries, chiefly in China, India, and Germany. If exportation of PSC can be tracked and controlled from its sources, we could go a long way in choking off the essential ingredient needed by criminal organizations now profiting by producing meth, chiefly in Mexico, and distributing it throughout this country. Fortunately, the administration has been making diplomatic efforts through the UN Commission on Narcotics Drugs, narcotic drugs to persuade some reluctant governments that the meth epidemic is global and that they should get with the program. Though the implementation of the Combat Meth Act is the second prong of the international meth strategy, the strategy restates provisions of the law while not always describing how ONDCP will ensure that implementation will be carried out by responsible agencies. The third prong of the international segment of the strategy, that of, that of law enforcement at the border and partnership with Mexico, summarizes current bilateral law enforcement efforts within Mexico. Efforts to train Mexican law enforcement and significantly upgrade its quality are extensive. Mexico has also moved aggressively to curtail illegal diversion of meth precursors, and in some respects, it is ahead of the United States in this area. Although the strategy states that its intent to strengthen border protection, it disturbingly fails to elaborate on this at all and is completely silent on what will be done in this area. In fact, the strategy makes no mention of the Department of Homeland Security, which contains multiple agencies tasked with border security and counter-drug activities. This is almost shocking 
considering that it now seems universally accepted within the administration that approximately 80% of the meth being consumed in this country is coming from Mexico. Stopping meth smuggling from Mexico is clearly imperative, and yet the strategy fails to explain why border protection is adequate or just how such protection will be strengthened. The domestic aspect of the strategy leans heavily on the requirement of working closely with state and local officials. The strategy acknowledges that the overwhelming majority of drug arrests and prosecutions, over 90 percent, are conducted by state and local authorities. Nonetheless, we have been told by people we trust that there wasn't much consultation or dialogue with state and local officials in crafting this strategy. And while it touts the efforts of state and local authorities, the administration seeks to drastically cut the federal program which have been essential to state and local law enforcement. For example, the administration wants Congress to eliminate the Burn Justice Assistant Grants Program, JAG. In 2004, one-third of all the meth labs seized were taken down by JAG-funded state and local drug task forces. The strategy fails to explain how the state and local authorities can be expected to keep up this pace of lab seizures if the administration succeeds in gutting the very programs that make it, make it possible. Why would you hold a press conference about a strategy based on programs you are proposing to eliminate? The administration has asserted that prevention is one of the three pillars of its anti-drug efforts. Yet declining funding in this area, only at 11.7 percent of the drug control budget, casts doubt on this claim. And the strategy is thin on prevention, with only a brief reference to research underway at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, and an almost as brief discussion of the National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign. The discussion ends by noting the importance of voluntarily airing the ads by local radio and TV stations, yet it says nothing about how such voluntary airing will be encouraged. One of the most appalling aspects of meth is its grisly aftermath. This includes children who are poisoned due to chemical saturation in homes where meth is produced, as well as cleanup of lab sites. And there are stories in the annals of meth epidemic of law enforcement personnel or firemen wounded or killed by lab site explosions or an inhalation of chemical fumes. While much of what is in this brief section is not considered a part of the strategy per se, the administration should be praised for its commitment to the drug endangered children, the DEC program. While DEC training has occurred in 28 states, the strategy asserts that ONDCP will work to achieve DEC training in all 50 states by 2008, with no further details offered. Hopefully, this excellent program will find more aggressive advocates on the federal level. We have a good mix of witnesses with us today. Our first panel consists of the Honorable Scott Burns, Deputy Director for State and Local Affairs of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Honorable Tom Dillon, Director of Counter Narcotics Enforcement for the Department of Homeland Security, Joseph Renanasisi, uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner of DEA's Office of Diversion Control, and finally we have Dr. Don Young, Acting Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. Our second panel will give us state and local perspective. We have Mr. Ron Brooks, President of the National Narcotics Officers Association's Coalition, the Honorable Eric Coleman of the Oakland County Board of Commissioners in Michigan, representing the so association, the National Association of Counties, Dr. Louis Gallant, Executive Director of the National Association of State and Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors, Ms. Sherry Green, the Executive Director of the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws, and finally we have Ms. Sue Thaw, public policy consultant for the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. Again, we thank you all for coming from so many places across the country to be here today. We look very much forward to your testimony. Now I'd like to yield to our uh, ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Good morning. Hello. All righty. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing today uh, to evaluate the administration's recently announced synthetic drug control strategy. The growing abuse of methamphetamine, other illegal synthetic drugs like ecstasy and a variety of pharmaceutical drugs defines a major recent trend in drug abuse. The recent enactment of the Combat Meth Act and the administration's release of the synthetic drug control strategy earlier this month underscore the seriousness of the problem. Meth, in particular, has captured the attention of lawmakers and the media with the devastating impact it is having 
on entire communities in many areas of our country. A powerfully addictive synthetic stimulant that has been around for more than 30 years, meth until relatively recently was concentrated in western states, including California, Arizona, and Utah. The recent eastward expansion of meth production, trafficking, and abuse has led to the drugs suddenly becoming recognized as one of the primary drug threats facing our nation today. Indeed, not since the introduction of crack cocaine into the streets of major cities like my city of Baltimore, New York, and Chicago have we seen such an outcry for an aggressive anti-drug response by government at all levels. A July 2005 report by the National Association of Counties, the meth epidemic in America, identifies meth as the number one illegal drug threat facing most of the 500 counties that participated in a survey of local law enforcement agencies. Moreover, the drug's destructive impact on families has contributed to a significant increase in child welfare roles in hundreds of counties across the nation, according to the same report. Meth is rel relatively unique in that it can be manufactured by lay people using ingredient, ingredients purchased in United States retail stores and uh, recipes available on the Internet. This has enabled most of the production of U.S. consumed methamphetamine uh, to occur domestically, both in so-called super labs that produce large amounts of high-purity meth and in clandestine labs that are small enough to be operated in homes, apartments, hotel rooms, rented storage space, and trucks. The environmental damage caused by meth production can be severe, and the cost of cleaning up the toxic waste uh, from these sites is immense. Because the ingredients are extremely volatile in combination, labs also pose a grave risk of harm both to the so-called meth cooks who make the drug and to the individuals living in close proximity to the activity. Many labs are discovered only after an explosion has occurred. Law enforcement officers tasked with finding or dismantling labs are forced to share the risk. All too often, the collateral victims of meth abuse are the young children of addicts and cooks. These children live with the constant risk of harm from explosions, exposure to toxic chemicals, and extreme fam familiar neglect. As the National Association of Counties report and countless news reports uh, have described, these conditions have led to a large number of children being taken from their custodial control of their parents and placed in foster care. Sadly, the health and behavior effects that result from prenatal exposure to meth and from severe family neglect or abuse make the children of meth-addicted parents especially challenging for foster, care, fam for, for foster families to care for and difficult to place. Absent effective treatment for the parents of displaced children, reuniting families torn apart by meth may be almost impossible. Meth abuse has not yet become a major problem in the communities of Baltimore City and Baltimore and Howard counties that, where I, that I represent. But the rapid spread of meth production, trafficking, and abuse in the United States underscores the fact that America's drug problem affects all parts of this nation, rural, suburban, and urban alike, and that no community is immune to the, to the introduction of a dangerous new drug threat. Drugs, unlike people, do not discriminate on the basis of color, class, or geography. States have been at the forefront of efforts to develop effective policies and strategies to combat the growth of meth abuse, production, and trafficking in the United States. States, including Oklahoma, have successfully used restrictions on retail sale of coal products containing meth precursor chemicals to drive down the volume of meth production in, clan in clandestine labs. Federal legislative efforts to address the meth epidemic, including the Combat Meth Act enacted earlier this year, similarly have focused largely on limiting over-the-counter access to products containing precursor chemicals, as well as on limiting the illegitimate importation and exportation of meth precursor uh, chemicals across the international borders. 
The administration's new synthetic drug control strategy emphasizes these objectives, and I believe Congress and the administration should continue to pursue them. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Chairman, I believe that it is difficult to overestimate the importance of education, prevention, and in particular, drug treatment as we attempt to stifle this growing epidemic. Despite some popular notions to the contrary, research uh, from the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment shows that meth addiction can be effectively treated and that the benefits of treating meth addiction are similar to the benefits derived from treating addiction to other drugs. Use of the drug is sharply reduced, criminal activity and recidivism decline, employment status and housing status improve, and overall health improves. Ensuring that people who have become dependent upon meth have access to effective treatment is therefore essential to stopping this problem that is creeping across our country. Unfortunately, it bears noting that the 53-page strategy announced by the administration devotes just three and a half pages to prevention and treatment combined. Indeed, several important programs that contribute to reducing demand for meth and other synthetic drugs are not even mentioned in the strategy which is incredible. In the case of safe and drug-free schools, state grants, for example, this is no doubt because the problem has been uh, targeted for elimination in the President's budget. This leads to the broader concern that this strategy, even as it purports to be comprehensive, appears to reflect the same flawed balance of priorities embodied in the overall federal drug control budget proposed by the President. Over the past six years, we have seen prevention and treatment dollars decrease from 47 percent to merely 35 percent of the federal drug budget. Even programs that support domestic and drug enforcement at the state and local levels have been targeted for elimination or deep cuts as funding for supply reduction efforts beyond our borders expands without solid justification. The High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, COPS Meth Grants, and the Burn Justice Assistance Grants, all critical programs would be eroded or eliminated. Given these facts, I think one of the central questions raised by today's hearing is this. Does the strategy genuinely reflect an ambitious, forward-thinking effort to devise the most comprehensive and effective synthetic drug strategy our federal drug policy experts can muster? Or does it instead represent mere, mere lumping together in one document of pre-existing ideas, initiatives, and priorities inside a new glossy cover? To help us answer these uh, and other questions, we are fortunate to have appearing before us today representatives of several federal agencies tasked with formulating and implementing various aspects of the synthetic drug strategy, as well as a number of outside organizations that contribute greatly to the nation's anti-drug efforts through their dedication and expertise. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all our witnesses concerning the content of the strategy, the manner in which it was formulated, and their perspectives on whether and to what extent the strategy adequately describes the best possible formula for beating back the growing threats of illegal synthetic drugs and prescription drug abuse. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your relentless, relentless attention uh, to this issue, and I, th I also thank each of our witnesses for appearing here today. And with that, I yield back. Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding uh, this hearing that is critical to the understanding of the administration's heavily anticipated synthetic drug control strategy. Eliminating drug smuggling and distribution throughout the United States is vital in keeping our communities safe. There have been several programs unveiled by the public and nonprofit sectors throughout the United States. These programs are going to be the next new innovation in helping us eradicate our drug problem. Some have been good and some have been not so good. None of them have been the ultimate problem solver. The new strategy set forth by the Office of National Drug Control Policy is very ambitious but not impossible if funding and resources are at a sufficient level. The three goals set forth in this strategy are excellent. If we could accomplish 
what the plan sets out, including 15% reduction in prescriptive drug abuse, 25% reduction in methamphetamine labs, and 15% reduction of methamphetamine use. It would be of great benefit to our people and our streets. While there are great goals, the question of how they are going to be met with the administration's funding cut proposals need to be addressed. Can these goals be accomplished when the administration wants a $23.6 million cut in the Justice Department's community-oriented policing services meth hotspots program? Can these goals be met when the administration wants to eliminate the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program. My family, personally, has been affected by meth use. My niece, at the end of May, passed due to the abuse of this killer drug. It affected her vital organs. She had a hole in her heart and from age 19 to age 22. We suffered along with her. The treatment programs we enrolled her in did absolutely nothing. Every method that we as a family and friends used to try and help her did not work. Prevention could have saved her. We lived in an upscale community in Sacramento. She lived with me. And we were right there. Did not notice until too late. Tried to save her and failed. So a focus on prevention so users would not have to face treatment is essential. The administration states that prevention is an essential component of its three pillars of anti-drug efforts. The decline of funding in this area has cast major doubts on their claim. If the administration is serious about creating a solution to this problem, fund each mandate sufficiently. And so I want to thank the panelists uh, for your willingness to come and testify before this subcommittee so we can understand how this new drug control strategy will be implemented in the midst of major cuts in funding. I don't want to see anyone suffer as my niece and her loved ones did. We must realize that drug use is international in scope, and for every one life that is lost to drugs, many are affected. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for this hearing today. Thank you, and thank You're you. Back. And thank you for your uh, continued uh, aggressive and active interest in this committee. It's been truly a bipartisan uh, effort as we move through this and other uh, drugs, and we're looking forward to our, our, our hearing on treatment as, as well that's coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, first, I'd like to ask you and ask consent that all members uh, have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, and that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record without objection. It's so ordered. I also ask and ask consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, and that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks without objection. It's so uh, order. Our first panel is composed of the Honorable Scott Burns, Deputy Director for State and Local Affairs of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Honorable Tom Dillon, Director of the Office of Counter-Narcotics Enforcement, Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Joseph Ranasisi, D Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Office of Diversion Control of DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and Dr. Don Young, Acting Assistant Director or Secretary for Planning and Evaluation for the Department of Health and Human Services. As an oversight committee, it's our standard practice to ask witnesses to testify under oath. If you'll raise your right hands, I'll administer the oath to you. Well, uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Yeah. Let the record show that all the witnesses <coughs> have answered in the affirmative. Mr. Burns, thank you for joining us. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Congresswoman Watson. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the administration's synthetic drug control strategy. 
I want to thank the subcommittee for its strong bipartisan commitment to reducing the illicit use of all drugs. The synthetic drug control strategy was released on June 1st and represents a firm commitment by the administration to work toward ambitious and concrete reductions in the illicit use of methamphetamine and prescription drugs, as well as in the number of domestic methamphetamine laboratories. Specifically, the strategy aims to reduce methamphetamine use by 15 percent over three years, <coughs> illicit prescription drug use by 15 percent over three years, and uh, domestic methamphetamine laboratory seizures by 25 percent over three years. In these respects, it is similar to the administration's national drug control strategy in that it is both ambitious and achievable. The synthetic strategy also recognizes that supply and demand are the ultimate drivers in an illicit drug market and that a balanced approach incorporating prevention, treatment, and market disruption initiatives is the best way to reduce the supply of and the demand for illicit drugs. The most urgent priority of the federal government toward reducing the supply of methamphetamine in the United States will be to tighten the international market for chemical precursors, such as pseudoephedrine and ephedrine, as you know, used to produce this drug. Towards this end, the Office of National Drug Control Policy Director John Walters has met with ambassadors from China, India, and the European Union. The administration worked with allies in the international community to draft, promote, and adopt a resolution on synthetic drug precursors, particularly methamphetamine precursors, at the annual meeting of the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drug. Other important parts of the synthetic strategy are swift and effective implementation of the Combat Meth Act and our continued partnership with Mexico. Domestically, the synthetic strategy recognizes the critical role that state and local law enforcement, as well as treatment and prevention professionals, play in addressing the methamphetamine threat. And in fact, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the role that state and local policy and law enforcement officials have played in addressing, in particular, the problem of methamphetamine production in the United States. The synthetic strategy contains a 10-part plan to enhance the federal partnership with state and local agencies related to methamphetamine, focusing on initiatives such as helping drug-endangered children programs expand nationwide, holding four regional and one national methamphetamine conference, and better sharing of data, and assisting states in developing their own regional drug control strategies uh, related to synthetic drugs. The synthetic strategy also addresses prescription drug abuse. The administration's ambitious goal of reducing prescription drug abuse by 15 percent by the end of 2008 must balance two general policy concerns. First, to be aggressive in reducing overall user abuse, and second, to avoid overreaching and avoid making lawful acquisition of medications unduly cumbersome. The seriousness of this problem cannot be overstated, as prescription drug abuse has risen to become the second most serious drug problem when measured in terms of prevalence, with past year abusers numbering approximately six million. The administration will continue to target <coughs> doctor shopping and other prescription fraud, as well as illegal online pharmacies, continue to thwart thefts and burglaries from homes and pharmacies, focus on strategies to combat stereotypical drug dealing, and to investigate and prosecute those in the medical profession to be distinguished from the vast majority that prescribe appropriately who are engaged in illegal overprescribing for profit. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, Congresswoman Watson, I would like to personally thank you, the members of the subcommittee and the members of the House and Senate Meth Caucuses for your individual and combined efforts in addressing these issues. I look forward to working with you and members uh, uh, of this subcommittee as the strategy is implemented and conferring along the road as we strive together to meet the goals we have set forth on behalf of the American people. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Mr. Dillon? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and Representative Watson. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security in support of the administration's national synthetic drug control strategy. And I look forward to working with this subcommittee in our common fight against the illicit use of methamphetamine and other synthetic drugs. As the Director of the Office of Counter-Narcotics Enforcement, it is my responsibility to coordinate counter-narcotics policy within the Department of Homeland Security and between the Department and other federal departments and agencies. 
I understand that methamphetamine abuse is a serious issue facing our nation. According to a recent report by a national association, 58% of counties surveyed said that methamphetamine was their largest drug problem, followed by cocaine, marijuana, and heroin. Increasingly, the methamphetamine that supplies the U.S. drug market is produced internationally, and the Department of Homeland Security is committed to stopping the flow of methamphetamine and its precursors into our country. The administration's synthetic drug control strategy, like the national drug control strategy, postulates a balanced approach by incorporating prevention, treatment, and market disruption initiatives as the best courses of action to reduce the supply of and demand for illicit drugs. The Department of Homeland Security is in a unique position to focus on market disruption through the strategic goals outlined in the Department's Secure Border Initiative, or SBI. The Department of Homeland Security's Secure Border Initiative is a comprehensive approach to border control and enforcement through the integration of technology, infrastructure, communications, and command and control designed to disrupt and dismantle criminal organizations by preventing and deterring cross-border crime, including, but not limited to, illicit drugs. SBI will provide a comprehensive, multi-year plan for more agents to patrol our borders, secure our ports of entry, and enforce immigration laws, as well as providing a comprehensive and systemic upgrading of the technology used in controlling the border, including increased manned aerial assets, expanded use of unmanned aerial vehicles, and next-generation detection technology. Through SBI, the Department of Homeland Security has developed the Border Enforcement Security Task Force concept, or BEST, and now has a practical vehicle to directly partner with state and local law enforcement officials to combat drug trafficking and border violence. BEST is charged with sharing information, developing priority targets, and executing coordinated law enforcement operations to enhance border security. By establishing a new connectivity between the Department's intelligence community and law enforcement, BEST provides a focused response to intelligence-driven identify targets such as criminal organizations that violate the border and will improve the Department's overall effectiveness against the full range of criminal activity along the border. The Department of Homeland Security fully embraces its counter-narcotics mission and will do its part to ensure the success of the synthetic drug control strategy by working cooperatively with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners tasked with combating the flow of illicit drugs into the United States. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ranasisi. Good morning, Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, Congressman Watson. On behalf of Administrator Karen P. Tandy, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the synthetic drug control strategy. This strategy is a companion document to the President's National Drug Control Strategy. The unique nature of synthetic drugs warrants a targeted response. DEA's efforts to address the synthetic drug problem have been ongoing for decades. The strategy provides DEA and contributing agencies a framework to continue our ongoing efforts and to chart new milestones to achieve domestic and international progress against methamphetamine and other synthetic drugs. DEA worked with DOJ and ONDCP to implement a comprehensive, innovative strategy to reduce availability of synthetic drugs and strengthen the international and domestic law enforcement mechanisms. The strategy focuses principally on methamphetamine and pharmaceutical control substances and incorporates many ongoing DEA programs that target these substances. Methamphetamine is a unique synthetic drug. Its production requires no specialized skills, training, and its various recipes are readily available over the Internet. Its precursor chemicals have historically been easy to obtain and inexpensive to purchase. The diversion of controlled pharmaceutical substances also continues to be a significant threat. Controlled pharmaceutical substances are diverted through several means, including illegal prescribing, theft, robbery, prescription forgery, doctor shopping, and, of course, the Internet. The manufacture and use of methamphetamine is not a problem confined to the U.S., but has become prevalent in many regions of the world. The DEA, through our law enforcement partnerships across the country and around the world, has initiated successful investigations that have disrupted and dismantled significant methamphetamine trafficking organizations, particularly those targeting the U.S. 
We have also taken an active role in fighting diversion of Fedrin and pseudofedrin through both enforcement operations and international agreements. These initiatives resulted in a substantial reduction in the amount of precursor chemicals entering the U.S., but we have more to do internationally. DEA has a key role toward achieving the administration's goals set forth in this strategy. Chief among our tasks will be the full implementation and enforcement of the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act of 2005. Other domestic initiatives will include a national listing on the DEA website of the addresses of properties in which methamphetamine labs or chemical dump sites have been found. In addition, construction for a new clandestine lab training facility at the DEA Academy will begin in the fall of 2006. A key element of the strategy for combating methamphetamine is international cooperation, particularly in the area of precursor chemical control. Already, DEA and DOJ have facilitated and played a leadership role in several recent meetings of the international community. These meetings, such as the May 2006 National Methamphetamine Chemical Initiative Strategy Conference, where the Attorney General announced several new anti-methamphetamine initiatives, have helped increase awareness around the world and resulted in agreements to monitor and track key per precursor chemicals. Several nations, most notably ne Mexico, also have taken independent steps to control methamphetamine precursors. Internet diversion of pharmaceutical controlled substances is especially difficult to investigate and overcome. Internet-based drug traffickers often mask their activities as those of legitimate online pharmacies. DEA's approach to pharmaceutical controlled substance abuse problems strives to balance two general policy concerns reducing the prescription drug abuse while not making the lawful acquisition of prescription drugs unduly cumbersome. DEA is joined by the interagency community and responsible private sector entities in its effort to prevent pharmaceutical controlled drug abuse and diversion. By collaborating with internet service providers and companies, credit card and financial service companies, and express mail carriers to target internet-based drug traffickers, DEA is at the cutting edge of online drug investigations. Although recent DEA operations are indicative of our ability to target the largest and most dangerous organizations, additional tools are needed. More can be done to eliminate websites that have telltale signs of their illicit nature, and steps can be taken to ensure that the legitimate doctor-patient relationship includes a face-to-face -face consultation. DEA is fully committed in its role to meet the ambitious goals set forth in the synthetic drug strategy, control strategy. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, and uh, Congresswoman Watson, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify and will be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Young? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the efforts of the Department of Health and Human Services in support of the administration's synthetic drug control strategy a focus on methamphetamine and prescription drugs. Dr. Young, could you move the microphone a little closer? I'm pleased to be here to talk about the HHS contribution to the administration's coordinated strategy for combating the problems of methamphetamine abuse. The synthetic strategy was released June 1st this year. Although HHS has been working with its federal partners to develop the National Synthetic Drugs Action Plan, since October 2004. The synthetics... Got it. Got it now. The synthetics strategy sets a goal of reducing methamphetamine abuse over three years, a 15 percent reduction in the abuse or non-medical use of prescription drugs over three years, and a 25 percent reduction in domestic methamphetamine laboratory seizures over three years. Much of the synthetic strategy is devoted to methamphetamine abuse. Methamphetamine is associated with serious health conditions, including memory loss, aggression, psychotic behavior, and potential heart and brain damage. HHS is engaged on these issues through a number of its agencies. HHS brings a wide array of resources to this issue. The HHS fiscal year 2007 budget provides $41.6 million for HHS methamphetamine targeted treatment and prevention research 
and a dedicated $25 million for methamphetamine treatment services within the Access to Recovery program. The Access to Recovery program is a voucher-based program intended to expand consumer choice and access to effective substance abuse treatment and recovery support services. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the Administration for Children and Families work together to provide training, technical assistance, information, and resources to local, state, and tribal agencies to improve systems and practice for families with substance abuse use disorders who are involved in the child welfare and family judicial systems. One of the key components of meth is a commonly used pharmaceutical product, pseudoephedrine. Pharmaceutical products containing pseudoephedrine, either alone or in combination with other drugs, are used extensively by the general public to treat the, systems of, uh, the symptoms of upper respiratory tract infections and allergic rhinitis. In carrying out our strategy to end methamphetamine abuse, we must balance the legitimate health needs of consumers to access to medicines against the urgent needs of law enforcement to confront a serious drug problem. We believe that the USA Patriot Act, recently enacted and signed into law, achieves this balance. It restricts the OTC sales of pseudoephedrine, ephedrine, and phenylpropanolamine, but also enables individuals to buy sufficient quantities for legitimate medical use. By working together in a coordinated, effective way, we can be successful in achieving the goals set out by the synthetics strategy. By drawing on the resources my colleagues and I are discussing with you today, we can be successful. Thank you for your time, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions. I thank each of you for your, your testimony, and uh, the, the button on the microphones are counterintuitive. If it's up, it's on. If it's down, it's, it's uh, not. Let me make a, a couple of additional uh, comments with, and, uh, with, with my frustration uh, that, uh, Mr. Burns, I, I hope ONDCP understood a very subtle message that Congress gave this week. And this, this hearing today is going to focus mostly on, on meth, most likely. You'll see this committee increasingly move as we hopefully start to turn some corner on meth, uh, at least get an uh, aggressive strategy in every agency, more towards other over-the-counter drugs, which clearly is a steady and increasing problem in the United States. We've had multiple hearings on Oxycontin over the years, but we focused on meth in this cycle because at the local level, that's what we're hearing constantly. The idea to battle meth didn't start in Congress, even though this committee ha held its first hearings probably seven years ago on this. It is something that's being demanded at the grassroots level. All you have to do is turn on your TV set in any market in almost every single state now, but certainly in about 40 states, it's still coming into the East Coast, and that will be the major story, and that that demand came on the, on the politicians. I have been a strong supporter of the national ad campaign. Last, there has been a concern that the national ad campaign has been dropping in its funding by the director and by, by others. I said that if the national ad campaign started to address some of it, I've not opposed the marijuana initiative, but some of it focused on meth, we could sustain the support in Congress. We brought a resolution to the floor last year, and it was increased by $30 million over the President's request if it was used on meth. That was ignored. This week, the Appropriations Committee reduced it yet further to where the national ad campaign is at risk. And as you full well know, in the Senate, they have not been as enthusiastic with the ad campaign as the House. It got reduced to $100 million. The administration came over and asked multiple members of Congress to introduce it. They talked to our leadership. Not a single member of Congress was willing to go to the floor to defend the position of the national ad campaign. Not one single member of either party because of the lack of responsiveness of this administration on meth. And if that message doesn't permeate, there'll be no national ad campaign. That's just, that's not a threat, it's a promise. 
that there has to be more responsiveness in an understanding of what's happening. Secondly, this is the second year in a row where you've come in proposing to zero out what's the primary funding of our drug task forces around the United States on meth. You work with state and local law enforcement. You know the intensity of this. On the Haida question, this year it wasn't a zeroing out of the Haida. I have asked repeatedly, what don't you like about Haida's? Which one? And the only answer I've gotten steadily is the proliferation of Haida's has occurred in the United States, denigrating the original mission of the Haida's, which was high intensity. Well, what is the proliferation of the Haida's? Where are those proliferations? Well, that would be the Missouri Haida, which is a meth Haida. That would be in Iowa, which was a meth Haida. That would be the Rocky Mountain Haida, which would be a meth Haida. That would be the Dallas Haida, which is focused more and more on meth. In other words, the administration's proposal, indirectly, though it's never said directly, it's said the proliferation, all of the new Haidas were meth Haidas. So that, that to come forward with the strategy, at the same time, while you're proposing to gut many of the things that are in it, we just don't don't see this reconciliation. Now let me be honest, we were looking for a few more specific things than uh, today in your testimony, what you chose to highlight was the Endangered Children Program, which is a, a great program and should be expanded, and conferences. We have meth conferences going through our ears in the United States. Any person who's in the field who can't, who can't go to a meth conference has, I don't know where they've been. There's, there's conferences all over the place. What we need are specifics. Quite frankly, the DEA presentation today, and DEA has been the only agency that's been very aggressive on this, uh, as opposed to somewhat aggressive on this, had more details than the plan, which is astounding. Here we wait and wait and wait, and we get a plan and, and a testimony that comes forward from one of the agencies is more detailed with specifics and some how to address how we're going to deal with this on Internet. We all know we're going to get control of the mom and pop labs. No thanks to the, the federal government. The state governments are already doing it, and now we're going to finish the rest of the states by October 1st. We're going to reduce the mom and pop labs. You're going to re reach your, your reduction figures, which are... are uh, uh, they're going to be done because of what other people already did. Uh, not necessarily on synthetic drugs overall. Over-counter over is going to be tougher. But in the mom and pop labs, we'll probably reach that. Uh, but it's going to move to the Internet. Uh, the, there were a number of things in DEA testimony to try to address that. Now, uh, let me ask Mr. Dillon, and I'm not holding you accountable because you're new uh, in the post, and we're glad to have you there. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we've worked together on the Homeland Security Committee, of which I'm a, a, a senior member. Why would the Department of Homeland Security not have been more mentioned, or uh, uh, how, how do you see uh, this integrated? For example, uh, I'm making some suggestions to you, and I would like to hear some of your comments back. Um, DEA, uh, 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 Mr. Aransisi made some comments about how they're looking at this. Clearly, uh, one of the things, since you're both uh, in charge uh, at, at Homeland Security of ICE, you're in charge of Coast Guard, and you're in charge of CBP. Uh, three of the major agencies with this, DEA would be a, a fourth that at the federal level provi provides uh, actual ground troops. Is there an awareness in the agency, do you see an awareness of the agency to look at the data that you're picking up? For example, uh, you're going to have the data of whether meth from Mexico is coming more across at Laredo or in the West. Are you going to look at that uh, data uh, and, and, and work uh, directly with DEA on the intelligence uh, agencies? Is ICE going to connect up with DEA? How do you propose to do that? Is Coast Guard going to do it? Are you going to look at, because as we shut down the mom and pop labs, both the Internet and the um, border, are going to become the places where crystal meth is coming in behind. We see that in Oregon already. We see it in, in uh, Oklahoma. The states that did the pseudo-federal control laws uh, have, have already seen the switch to crystal meth. It's coming your way. It's coming through all of your zones. Are you going to try to uh, separate out the data here? Are you going to work with it? Are you going to uh, work with particular strategies? Uh, are, are your agents? I'm less concerned about a, a national conference than basically making sure that CBP and ICE understand that, that the meth uh, pressure is going to come at yours and you're, you're watching for that uh, and, and the patterns. Well, uh, Chairman Souter, it's I believe that it's my responsibility as the director of the Office of Counter-Narcotics Enforcement to, uh, uh, 
to obtain that information, that data that you're talking about, and to ensure that the counter-narcotics related components within the department have that data and are appropriately focused on uh, the meth threat. Uh, as you have pointed out, and I think as everyone has acknowledged, uh, methamphetamine is now largely moving across the borders, which makes it a Department of Homeland Security issue. And as far as I'm concerned, a Department of Homeland Security pri priority in the counter-narcotics realm. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, we will be looking at the data and we will be uh, ensuring that the counter-narcotics related components that you've mentioned have that data and we will be emphasizing the, uh, the importance of including methamphetamine interdiction uh, in the overall counter-narcotics strategy. Uh, Dr. Dr. Young, one of my uh, concerns, uh, and I've talked to Director Curry about this as well, um, is, is that uh, methamphetamine, uh, one of the, the pattern differences is it tends to be uh, l less so for crystal meth, but where it's been so far in the mom pop Nazi labs tends to be in the most rural areas of America uh, that uh, where the drug treatment programs are in fact least sophisticated. Uh, much of the, the type of, of uh, approaches that HHS re recommends and SAMHSA recommends are, are uh, uh, fairly complicated. And, and when uh, Director Curry came into my district, the only group that was implementing it was in Fort Wayne where they've only had basically three or four cases of meth. One of the, the uh, to outlying mid-sized cities had been at a conference where that subject was discussed. And the rural area that was hardest hit with meth had the least, the most underpaid, the just out of school trainee who hadn't even heard of the concept. Is there an understanding in HHS of, of uh, these two variables? One is, is that um, uh, this, uh, the, the one type of phenomena tends to be a rural phenomena often coming out of uh, where there are national forest areas or more rural places because of the smell of labs, they hide out there. And then the second, as the, the uh, crystal meth comes in, uh, the, uh, you have a different type of pressure and that may become a more urban pressure, although some of the rural areas may pick it up. Is there that type of sophistication and analysis internally? And then secondly, um, uh, the, the uh, strategy suggested that there was a, uh, uh, a difference of opinion suggesting that meth treatment does work, which there are lots of conflicting uh, opinions on, on how and how well. Uh, but what are you doing to overcome that and to, to target it? Are you saying that the same treatment programs work for meth that work for elsewhere? Are they particular treatment programs with variations? Uh, is, uh, uh, and could you address some of those type of uh, questions? Yes, I would uh, <clears throat> imagine that uh, Mr. Curry gave you uh, uh, a response to that as well. The whole problem of healthcare delivery and substance abuse treatment as a subset of healthcare delivery in rural areas is an extremely difficult one. It's one both of resources, as you point out, and, and how to get resources in adequate amounts, but it's also of manpower and skilled people, which you pointed out. You can attempt to deal with some of that through other kinds of social programs, transportation support, that has limited value as well. So I think, yes, there is a realization about that in the, in the department. Uh, that realization goes far beyond simply methamphetamine to other drugs, but to other health care services in rural areas. A uh, very different set of problems than uh, in the inner city, although the inner city has problems as well. They're just very different kinds. So yes, I think we are aware of it. Um, on the issue of, uh, of treatment, um, it's very clear treatment does work. Treatment is very difficult. It's very difficult for any substance abuse problem, uh, and that includes methamphetamine. But when one looks at treatment, one also has to look at treatment in the context of the individual, the family, their lifestyle, where they live. If you treat an individual and they go back to the environment that they were living in prior to treatment, their chance of recidivism is much greater. This has to be an integrated approach. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, the problem that uh, ACF is dealing with and families, this is a family problem, an individual problem, a medical problem, a social problem, and it has to all be approached together. It cannot be, be approached from a single facet.
the um, Mr. Young, I want to pick up where we left off there. One of the things about meth is that um, it has a very uh, traumatic, direct effect upon families and particularly children. And um, can you tell me about any new programs coming up that will help these children? Let me let me let me tell you where I'm going. I've lived long enough and seen enough in Baltimore to now see generational cycles of drug use. As a lawyer, prior to coming to Congress had an opportunity to represent the children and sometimes the grandchildren of people that I represented when I first came to practice with regard to drug crime. And so you see these generational cycles and I'm just wondering what are we doing to try to stop I know any of you who have anything else you want to add, I, I'm, I'm curious, to stop the generational cycles of this continuing to go on. Your question is directed your question is directed to the prevention side or to the treatment side or to both? I'm asking well you can talk about I'm talking about when these kids are found in these houses, uh, these labs, there are a lot of issues, foster care problems arise. As we've traveled across the country, so many local officials said that we've been overburdened by be, with regard to kid issues. And I'm just wondering, you know, you can talk about any kind of way you want. I'm just trying to figure out we've got a major agency here that deals with health, and I'm just wondering exactly what you all are doing about it, if anything. The um, various parts of the department, but in the issue of the children, it would be the agency for, for children and families that are involved. Part of what we're doing is making sure we're coordinating across the new research, the research which is showing more treatment patterns and what works best with the service delivery. So one is the integration and the coordination and the sharing of information from those people who are doing research on what works, whether it's prevention or treatment, and those that are running the programs. Much of that is done through grants or it can be done through the Access to Recovery program. There will be different approaches taking in different communities. There is no one single way to do it or one single program to do it. So there is discretion given to the communities in how they carry out the individual prevention or treatment programs and education. Under all circumstances, though, we do everything we can to bring the newest state of the knowledge to those folks. Mr. Burns, let's go, let's uh, just want to go to this uh, synthetic drug control strategy. Uh, Dr. Young, by the way, I'm going to get back to you. Uh, I, I think I want a little bit more information. We can, um, Perhaps you can do it in writing, but um, I, I was not satisfied with your answer. But let's let's go on. We have a limited amount of time. Um, can you explain to me, Mr. Burns, exactly? And I know we're going to be talking later about uh, at another hearing about treatment. But help me understand how only three and a half pages were of the synthetic drug control strategy was devoted to prevention and treatment. What, I mean, is that, what, what happened? I mean, is it? Well, Mr. Cummings, the strategy is balanced. Uh, there are no monumental breakthroughs with respect to treatment protocols. I think that one of the things that we all agree upon now, you mentioned uh, in your opening statement, that people suffering from uh, the disease of addiction to methamphetamine can be treated. And there are successes every day uh, across the country. Uh, the intent of the strategy was not to equal the pages uh, so that uh, 11 pages were for treatment and prevention, 11 for supply reduction. It was a strategy 
that is comprehensive with respect to what we are facing uh, today. And in that respect, let me say this. Uh, and well, since we, got, since we have all this balance here, why don't you just specifically tell me what the prevention and treatment strategies are? Go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. You said, you said, I said three and a half pages. You said, well, all those three and a half pages out of 80-something is balanced. Fine. Tell me what they are. What, what do we have new here? I mean, the people who are looking at this right now, who are sitting in their, neighbor, in their rural homes, and the mayors and city council people trying to figure out, have some hope that they can deal with a problem that is devastating their communities. And I've got one of the top drug people in the nation, and just a wonderful expert, and they are looking to hear from your lips. They want to get past the three and a half pages. And so let's talk about the balance. I mean, what? talk to me. The response would be a $12.7 billion request from this president and this administration, which is $80 million more than Congress enacted last year. So that's a start. The second thing I would say is uh, on, on meth? overall federal drug control budget. We have to start somewhere. We start with the premise that the commitment from this administration against uh, illicit drug use in this country is larger than it's ever been. With respect to treatment, uh, some uh, $4.5 billion uh, requested by the president in 2007. Now, let me, let me address the question about mayors and people sitting in cities. This administration and the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy for two years now has sent me and other deputies and a large uh, amount of staff to 25-plus major cities in this country, including Baltimore, including Sacramento including Indianapolis. And we have sat down with mayors and chiefs of staffs and, and police chiefs and treatment and prevention folks. We've talked about, do you have community coalitions? Do you have drug courts? What's happening with your burn grant money? Is there a balance in your particular city? For the first time, uh, we've had a national discussion about how federal, state, and local monies are applied uh, against the threat in a particular city. Well, let me, can we, can we, let's put a pin right in that. When you meet with all these wonderful elected officials and, and, and community people, do they tell you that the HIDA, did they tell you that the HIDA and the COPS grants and should be uh, reduced, the elimination of the burn grants? I mean, did they tell you that? Didn't hear that. You didn't hear that? They did not tell us that they were in favor of reducing burn grant or HIDA. I'm did you ask them how they felt about it? I mean, these, these are the people who are on the front line. These are the people that we have to, to face. These are the people who are suffering and trying to keep their communities together. I, and I applaud you. I, I really do. I think it's wonderful that you went to the 25 uh, areas. I mean, I think that's great. The question is, it's not the visit. It's what's happening during the visit and what kind of interaction there is. Because as the chairman has said, there are people who are crying out. And they're asking us to do something. And we're trying to get things done we want to lose use the taxpayers dollars effectively and efficiently you're telling me you're doing these these wonderful tours but I'm wondering number one are you presenting to them saying to them this is what we're proposing to do and this is why we think it's gonna work and then I want to know what they're saying back to you I and, and I and I and I can guess the reason why you're not hearing this is because a lot of them are very much opposed to this stuff let me tell you one thing that they're all saying. Then let me ask you one last question, then I, I want to hear your answer. It's one thing to, for us, to, for all of us to sit in, you know, nice offices and whatever and feel real good about what we're doing and, you know, read nice reports and put them on the shelf, whatever. It's another thing for that person who is out there dealing with this every day. Some of the testimony that we heard, as a matter of fact, in, in Congressman Sauter's district, if I remember correctly, I mean, it was just so alarming. And the struggles that these people are having, I'm just, and I, so I, I just want to know, what, how do we take your efforts out there, going out and doing your tour, and combine them and bring, bring back something to your agency and the president so that we can be presented with something that is more reflective what, of what we are hearing so that we can do for folks who are on the front line. 
I'm not talking about somebody in in a in a uh, ivory tower. I'm talking about somebody who's dealing with this every day. Help me with that. Well, you're looking at the face of the administration of the person that deals with this every day. I don't sit in a nice office. I just spent the last two days in Chicago meeting with people from all over the country dealing with fentanyl. I've been to the chairman's district twice. We talked about drug endangered children. Then why are we? Why are we? prosecutor and treatment officials and we came up with a strategy for that particular part of the country and I do it every day from California to Maine congressman that's what the office of national drug control policy does to bring forth a balanced strategy of prevention treatment and law enforcement and we may disagree on the numbers we may disagree on the outcomes but I can tell you in a lot of cities what they say is thank God there's been a 19.1 percent reduction in drug use among our young people. Thank God that methamphetamine use, as measured by the tool that we've used for a long time, shows a 30% plus reduction in methamphetamine among 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. Uh, is there more work to do? Absolutely. But did, they say thank, did they say thank you for trying to cut our HIDA program and cut our COPS program? Did they say thank you about that, too? I think I answered that. The, <clears throat> the answer is no. Is that right? That's correct. Oh. My frustration, and I, I, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Burns, I don't want to say Scott, but Mr. Burns, official. I really appreciate that you came to my district. When you say we came up with a strategy, that is not the way that local law enforcement would view what, what happened in my district. They're, they were already working on it. They don't view that ONDCP or that the meetings we held, which were good, came up with the strategy for meth. That was a uh, slight over-exaggeration of, of the meetings that we held. And, and uh, uh, secondly, um, when Mr. Cummings asked you what you were uh, proposing to do on meth treatment, you didn't say anything. You, didn't, you had no answer. You, you filibustered for a little while, but you had no answer. Uh, I think a, a better representation of what ONDCP's position has been, not necessarily yours personally, was to say we don't like to do strategies on specific drugs, which you had in the uh, official testimony. And uh, because of that, it's very hard to answer. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be holding a hearing in Montana. Um, I venture to say that I will be, ask, be able to ask every single witness a question like what Mr. Cummings just said. What are you doing on treatment? And they'll give a specific answer. They're a businessman went into Montana who wasn't from Montana. Now, we're trying to figure out what impact it's had and how it's, what all that type of, uh, those type of questions. But bottom line is, they're going to give specifics. They're going to say, we put money in an ad campaign. We did this on treatment. We're doing this in the schools. We're having kids do pledges. This is our mess strategy. That's what we're looking for here, not some compilation of what Congress has passed and what state and locals are going to do, which, by the way, the administration proposed to cut. And that's part of our frustration. Ms. Watson? Can I respond to that briefly? Yes. And, and because you brought up the National Youth Media Campaign a couple of times. Uh, Director Walters uh, launched uh, methamphetamine ads. As you know, they're targeted towards 23 major markets uh, in this country. Uh, I think that uh, the dialogue that you and others, members of this subcommittee, had with Director Walters uh, it's been positive, and, what was and those the total? ads are, are, are going forward today. What was the total amount? I think 23, oh, the, the amount of the money? I, I don't know. I think it was uh, less than 5% uh, uh, that uh, I also know that uh, Congressman Wolf designated that in an appropriations bill. It wasn't something that was necessarily voluntarily done uh, and that uh, it was opposed when he designated and it, it is that is part of our our frustration of when Congress takes an action and then the administration does the minimalist strategy with it and then claims like it's a big meth initiative we're not very impressed uh, can I just say as you know mr. chairman the national youth media campaign is directed toward young people uh, 12 to 17 year olds. Methamphetamine, the initiation age, is 22. That's been part of the discussion that we've had with respect to how the media campaign uh, is focused uh, and directed. Uh, our intent is to prevent young people from ever starting. We know if the, we can get a kid to 18 or 20, there's a 98 percent chance they will never be addicted to any drug. And, and that is uh, the policy and that's the strategy. 
Watson? From my own experience uh, in Sacramento, I looked for years for a program, and I think you just uh, hit the real concern is that possibly there was something for teenagers, but this niece of mine died at age 22. I could not find a program that would take her. Dr. Young said that you can't put them back into the same communities, to the same households where the problem existed. So you want to have somewhere, maybe a transition, after she got out of the hospital, and she was hospitalized almost every other month, after she got out of the hospital, she had to come back home. The hospital would release her, put her in a taxi cab, and put her on her mother's doorstep. I would go from Washington, D.C. to Sacramento. I represent Los Angeles. I live in Los Angeles. But I was involved as often as I could be. What is missing out in the communities are programs, halfway houses, places where a person who has just been emancipated, 18 years old, but still young, can go for treatment and care and being taken out of the communities. I want you to know, in the Sacramento area, meth is readily available. They bring it to you. You don't have to go to them. They bring it to you. And what I tried to do was to get her in a place. There were none. I had to get her in something called Teen Challenge. She was to go in on that Monday. She died Monday morning at 7.13 a.m. at age 22. I couldn't even get the hospitals to understand what we needed. They said, she's been here, and there's nothing else we can do. Send her home. She, last thing she said to me, two weeks before she died, Aunt Diane, I need help. I couldn't find the program. Teen Challenge, they take them up to 24, thank God. So I thought I could get her in there for two years at least. But there really aren't programs. My question is, is there a way, and I've been reading through your report, and I appreciate the statistics that I find in here, but is there some way we can learn about programs in our local communities that will take young people who have been emancipated, 18 and beyond? We can go to the schools and we can talk about it, but there really aren't any real effective programs of preventions in schools because the health programs are the ones that are usually uh, have very low attendance and uh, we cut down on the staff and the faculty that would be providing the information. So what we need are community-based kind of walk-in programs. And uh, if we're really going to do the job, because uh, I think all the literature shows that meth use is done in the suburbs and the rural areas. And so I would like to see if you go to Sacramento, if you go to other parts of the country and you have talked to the medical community, law enforcement community, social services community, programs that they provide that we can put people in who are in great need but might not have the resources personally to deal with their problem. That would be very, very helpful. And then I think we could really feel the outreach. I think it's out of control in the Sacramento area. Uh, I don't necessarily have that problem in my district. I have a crack cocaine problem in the Central Los Angeles district. Mm -hmm. But methamphetamines, the use attacks the vital organs and will result in death. How can we stop it? What programs are available? Can you get information? You can start with me with the Sacramento area. At least I can help somebody else up in that area where I lived for 20 years, help families and so on. So if you could provide that information, what programs are available and what, uh, what's the criteria for eligibility for those programs and what are the age spans? 
that would be very helpful to us, and I'm sure in Baltimore it would be helpful in Chicago and other areas where the problem is increasing, not decreasing, increasing. Well, let me just say this, and, and part of uh, the challenge that we face nationally, if we have 19.1 million people using illegal drugs, uh, we know that about 7 million meet the clinical definition of addiction and about 2 million are currently in treatment. Part of the challenge we face nationally is getting the 5 million that are addicted to, number one, understand that they have a problem because they don't think they do. And number two, uh, once that realization uh, comes about, whether it's a crash of an automobile or an arrest uh, at a nightclub when somebody is charged with a criminal offense, is then getting them in uh, to treatment. I'm sorry for your loss, and I mean that uh, sincerely. Let me just interrupt you, because I have another committee I must go to. But we understand all that. I'm a former school psychologist in my other life, and I understand that. Where can we go and get the kind of treatment a person between these ages, 18 and, say, 35, where can we go? What's available? Is there a directory? How do we access that information? That How do we make the connection? I could call and tell, I could have called and said to her mother, take her here. I, I got to the social worker, what, and they looked all over the country, and there was nothing. There was nothing. So you're going to Sacramento. I don't know what it resulted in, but I can tell you what, and this is just recently. She died May 29th, you see? There was nothing except Teen Challenge, and they stretched it to let me get her in there. Well, I will provide for Thank you, you the information with respect to treatment that's available in that's the Sacramento area. That's what I need. But I just wanted to finish my point. One of the things that we have funded and the National Drug Control Policy is doing, and I give this to you just by way of example following my last point of getting people into treatment, is funding what's called a screening or brief intervention program. We have professionals in emergency rooms and in, in uh, Division of Family Services offices trying to identify those people that are suffering uh, from addiction and then get them into treatment. So there, there is a national effort to help those that uh, uh, are undergoing this condition. Can you supply, and I know I've been very personal with this, but I'm sure my colleagues have the same needs because in our offices walks every kind of issue imaginable. Is there a directory that is being developed that will put it in categories where people can go numbers to call? Because I went to social services in, in the county and I couldn't find anything so I went to a private uh, organization. That's where I found Teen Challenge. I'll so if you could you. supply and you might want to work on it nationally, wherever you know we have programs under the control of your uh, program and department. If you could supply it to all of us, it would be a tremendous help. We'll do the legwork. Don't mind doing that. But we need to know on the end of the other end of that, there are those resources. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to be voting uh, uh, shortly, but I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Young, uh, one question. We may have some additional uh, written questions from each of us as well. But uh, we had contacted um, FDA about what you were doing on uh, pseudofedrin and, and precursor chemicals um, uh, some time ago and then received a uh, letter back saying that was DEA that's in charge of that. But in your uh, testimony, you stated that uh, FDA was, was co-chair of the, with DEA, who said foreign pseudoephedrine co-chaired by FDA and DOJ, online diversion co-chaired by FDA and DEA, uh, that um, if, um, when we contacted you, you said, oh, we're, we're not involved in this, this is DEA. What are you doing in those areas? I'll have to get back to you with more information from Okay, uh, I would appreciate that because we had this outstanding letter from a number of months ago and we just heard back before the hearing that, oh, we don't do that, but your testimony says you do, and we'd like to get that reconciled. Thank you very much, uh, and I, I want to thank uh, each of you for 
what I know is, is, is hard work. I know in Department of Homeland Security will be, be continuing to track in, in your position uh, as we, we see this become more and more of a border issue and a, and a uh, issue re related to uh, how it's getting into the United States. Your agency is going to be critical with that. Uh, the, as we watch this move online, I'm sure the, a lot of the follow through, it's going to move in, into uh, crystal meth is going to start to behave, methamphetamine is going to start to behave like crack, marijuana, heroin, and other types of, of drugs as it moves into these underground networks. And, and we'll be working with you over time. And the, the treatment question is coming up in, a, in another hearing. And we'll continue to work with Director Curry as, as, as well as you, Dr. Young. I look forward to your work. And uh, 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 Mr. Burns, continue to go out and, and talk with the state and locals. We hope that the administration will hear a little bit more what they're saying, and uh, in, particularly in the budget request. With that, uh, we'll uh, 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 dismiss each of you. Thank you for coming. And could the second panel uh, come forward? The second panel is the Honorable Eric Coleman, Oakland County Commissioner of, in Michigan, Detroit suburb. Uh, National Associ from representing the National Association of Counties, Dr. Louis Gallant, Executive Director, National Association of State and Alcohol Drug Abuse Directors, Ms. Sherry Green, the Executive Director of the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws, Ms. Sue Thao, a Public Policy Consultant for the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, and Mr. Ron Brooks, President of the National Narcotics Officers Association, Coalition Director, Northern California, Haida. As a oversight committee, it's our standard practice to swear in all written witnesses of each raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony given today is the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth, self be God? <coughs> Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We thank you each for coming, and Mr. Coleman, we'll start with you. You thank can move you. if you can move the mic. Uh, Ranking member coming for allowing me to appear this morning on behalf of the National Association of Counties on this critical issue of methamphetamine abuse and the recent release of synthetic drug control strategy. My name is Eric Coleman, and I am a county commissioner from Oakland County, Michigan. In addition, I am currently serving as first vice president of the National Association of Counties. The National Association of Counties, or NACO, is the only organization that represents county government. With over 2,000 member counties, we represent 85% of the nation's population. Abuse of a methamphetamine, or meth, is a growing issue for counties across the nation. It is consuming a greater share of county resources because of its devastating and addictive nature. In response to the administration's new synthet synthetic drug control strategy, I would like to make two key points. First, NACO commends the administration for now recognizing the dangerous threat posed by methamphetamine and, the developing, and developing a synthetic drug strategy to deal with this threat. However, NACO believes that the state and local government and, local and, and law enforcement should have been consulted during the development of this strategy. Second. NACO hopes that this strategy will translate into future budget requests for programs that are critical to fight methamphetamine abuse, such as the Justice Assistance Grant Program, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. To illustrate the severity of the meth crisis, NACO commissioned four surveys on the impact to county government. Very briefly, our results have found that the meth is is a top drug threat facing county sheriff departments. That meth is leading to the alarming number of child out of home placements. That meth is a top drug seen at emergency rooms and that the need for meth treatment is growing. These statistics confirm that meth is a national crisis that requires national leadership and a comprehensive strategy to fight this epidemic. 
Consequently, we would like to commend the administration for recognizing the challenges of meth crisis, crisis, crisis and put forth a plan. However, a major weakness in this strategy is a lack of input from state and local governments and law enforcement. We hope that this, this, this regard for state and local stakeholders can be remedied by the four inclusive meth sum summits that are planned for 2006. If we had been consulted, NACA would have told the administration that their timeline to address the environmental dangers of meth production and use is unacceptable. The administration's plan to release voluntary cleanup standards in January 2011 is far too late. NACO has been a champion of the House Pass Meth Remediation Act and hope that the Senate will pass the bill soon. These guidelines are desperately needed to provide direction to state and local governments and property owners on how to clean up a former meth lab. Additionally, the strategy fails to mention the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, which amounts to about 40% of the total public funds spent on drug abuse prevention and treatment. NACO urges Congress to increase funding for this important program. In contrast, NACO views the administration's commitment to tighter, tighten control on the distribution of bulk pseudomenophen on the international level as a positive. As a proponent to combat meth epidemic act, which you sponsored, Mr. Chairman, we applaud their pledge to fully implement the legislation. Also, NACO supports the, de the de development and training of additional drug and danger child children teams. These teams play a vital role in responding to the needs of children affected by meth. For this strategy to be an effective tool, the administration must commit additional resources to meth-related programs, such as local enforcement, treatment, and prevention. Programs such as JAG and HIDA are critical to the local law enforcement's ability to tackle the meth crisis. They have proven to be effective, and we urge Congress to reject the administration's budget proposal on these programs. Without a change in future budget requests for meth-related programs, this strategy will be nothing more than a government document sitting on a shelf. In conclusion, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. On behalf of NACO, we will be conducting further surveys on meth abuse and look forward to reporting our findings and working with you in resolving the meth crisis in this country. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Gallant. It's good to have you back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Sauter, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, and Congresswoman uh, Watson. I am Dr. Louis Gallant, Executive Director of the National Association of State Alcohol Drug Abuse Directors, or NACIDAD. Thank you for your leadership in seeking input regarding the synthetic drug control strategy. NACIDAD members have the frontline responsibility of managing our nation's publicly funded substance abuse system. NACIDAD's mission is to promote effective and efficient state substance abuse systems. The association's number one message is this. People suffering from methamphetamine addiction, just like those suffering from addiction to other substances of abuse, can recover and do recover. This message of hope, grounded in science, proven through data, and illustrated every day by countless Americans living in recovery serves as the linchpin of our work. Turning to the synthetic drug control strategy, the association agrees with the administration's assessment that a comprehensive approach is needed in order to achieve success and that the manifestation of the synthetic drug problem in one state may be very different from that in another state. I offer to the committee five core recommendations. First, coordinate and collaborate with single state authorities for substance abuse or SSAs. The job, job of each SSA is to plan, implement, and evaluate a comprehensive system of care. 
As a former state substance abuse director of Virginia, I know firsthand the benefits of promoting interagency coordination. From public safety to child care, transportation to employment, state addiction agencies need to be at the table when initiatives are developed and implemented. Second, expand access to treatment and treatment infrastructure. The number one priority for NACIDAD is the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, the foundation of our treatment system and a program not mentioned in the synthetic drug control strategy. SAMPA data from three states demonstrate the following for block grant supported services for methamphetamine addiction. In Colorado, 80% of methamphetamine users were abstinent at discharge in FY203. In our, in a 2003 study found that 71.2% of methamphetamine users were abstinent six months after treatment. And in Tennessee, over 65% of methamphetamine users were absent, abstinent six months after treatment. NASADAD is aware of this committee's interest in improved data reporting. The association is partnering with SAMHSA to make excellent progress in implementing the National Outcome Measures or NOMS initiative. NOMS is designed to improve our system by emphasizing performance and accountability through data reporting on core sets of measures from all states across all SAMHSA grants, including the SAPT block grant. Moving on to number three, enhanced prevention services and infrastructure. Once again, the SAT, SAPT block grant is vital, dedicating 20% of its funding or $351 million to support important prevention services that help keep our kids drug free. The association strongly supports SAMHSA's strategic prevention framework state incentive grant. However, we remain concerned with the administration's proposed cut of $11 million to the framework and extremely concerned with the proposal to eliminate altogether the Safe and Drug-Free Schools State Grant Program. Number four, solid support for research is vital, especially at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, so that we may build on the Institute's impressive portfolio. And number five, enhance tools to share knowledge and best practices. The Addiction Technology Transfer Centers, or ATTCs, and the Centers for the Application of Prevention Technology, CAPS, are regional centers, centers funded by SAMHSA that help train our workforce through distance learning and other mechanisms and share best practices to help ensure that we are implementing effective programs backed by the latest science. I have run out of time, <laughs> but let me just say that states across the country are moving forward to implement cutting edge initiatives. We look forward to working with all stakeholders to continue this momentum and improve our collective work on methamphetamine and prescription drug abuse. I'll welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Green. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, Congressman Watson, staff, my name is Sherry Green and I want to thank you very much for this opportunity on behalf of the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws to testify regarding the recently released synthetic drug strategy plan. I also want to take a few moments to thank members of Congress, particularly this committee, for your strong role in working with state and locals on addressing synthetic drug issues. As you may know, my organization works with states to strengthen their drug and alcohol laws to create a more comprehensive, coordinated, and efficient continuum of drug and alcohol services throughout the state. We work with state and local professionals on over 40 different drug and alcohol issues. Over the last two years, the overwhelming majority of requests that we have received for legislative and policy assistance are unquestionably on the issues of methamphetamine and prescription drug addiction and diversion issues as well. Based on our legislative and policy work, I offer the following comments on the strategy. We do appreciate the fact that the strategy actually recognizes the leadership role of states in enacting measures to reduce and restrict over-the-counter purchases and sales of pseudoephedrine products. Despite this recognition, however, I see no description of an ongoing mechanism to gather the valuable input of these recognized leaders. So apparently, under this strategy, it's okay for state and local leaders to play a strong leadership role when that means doing the hard work of creating and implementing solutions to drug and alcohol problems, but it doesn't mean that they should take a strong leadership role in developing national strategy. Moreover, 
these recognized state and local leaders had to accomplish their gains on over-the-counter restrictions without the benefit of any comprehensive nationally compiled data on methamphetamine, including the costs related to methamphetamine laboratories. State and locals have repeatedly requested the need and expressed the need for a national mechanism which would collect available methamphetamine information, organize it in a cogent manner, indicate the policy implications of that particular information, and disseminate the information to state legislators and other policymakers in a timely manner so they can use the information to make informed, educated decisions. Nothing in the strategy suggests a response to this need for comprehensive, coordinated data at a national level. Despite our great disappointment over this obvious gap, we are somewhat encouraged that the strategy at least mentions treatment and prevention. However, the strategy right up front admits that there's a common misperception about the fact that methamphetamine addiction can be treated. Based on our experience, the, some of the very people who hold that misperception are state legislators and other policymakers who are charged with making funding policy and programmatic decisions. But I see nothing in the strategy that offers proactive options for actually correcting this perception. And from our experience, the failure to actually aggressively address this gap in knowledge leads to a further misperception that there is no current understanding of what works in terms of treating methamphetamine addiction. So we have, in our work, certain state and local policymakers who are actually more inclined to try to put scarce resources in their state towards researching what we already know rather than providing direct services. So it is our sincere hope that our federal colleagues will actually try to address these gaps that I've mentioned. And I would tell you that it is also our overall hope that in terms of any strategy that the federal government puts together on synthetic drugs, that it becomes more than just 63 or 53 pages of lip service. We're not gonna know if we're actually gonna actualize that hope until we actually see a demonstrated commitment to turning those principles and ideas into action plans. In closing, I'd just like to thank my colleagues on the panel for their generosity and their hard work at the state and local level because they have allowed us to coordinate with them so that our work can actually reflect the valuable experience and expertise of their constituencies. And of course, at the appropriate time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sa. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, Congressman Watson, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America and our more than 5,000 coalition members nationwide. I am pleased to provide you with CADCA's perspective on the synthetic drug control strategy. During my tenure as an OMB budget examiner, I analyzed many proposed national strategies. I know firsthand that the ones with the most impact had sufficient budgetary and other resources allocated to them to ensure they achieved results. The synthetic drug control strategy seems comprehensive. However, it simply repackages the administration's existing budget priorities. The strategy ignores key programs that provide the majority of the community infrastructure and core support to local law enforcement prevention and treatment efforts to deal with meth where it has emerged as a crisis. Prevention is the first line of defense in protecting communities from drug abuse, and it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. It hinges on the extent to which schools, parents, law enforcement, business, and the faith community work comprehensively to implement a full array of education, prevention, enforcement, and treatment initiatives. Unfortunately, the prevention portion of the strategy is very weak and only highlights three programs. It totally ignores two of the main federal programs that have been addressing meth, the Drug-Free Communities Program and the state grants portion of the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Program. These programs are vitally important because they fund community and school-based prevention infrastructures that can immediately incorporate meth components where meth is a problem. We know people don't usually start their drug use and careers with meth because, as been mentioned before, the mean age at which people initiate meth use is 22. The epidemiology of drug use indicates that use trends often spread to adolescence. So although meth is not currently a major issue among most school-aged youth, it certainly could become one. And in fact, in many communities where meth is a crisis, use rates for school-aged youth are way above state and national averages. The prevention lesson to be learned from meth use, given its relatively late onset, is that the more successful we are at general drug prevention, the less we will have to deal with meth use and addiction. CATGA knows from its members that this is already happening. Coalitions know what their local drug problems are and take the necessary steps across community sectors to counteract them. The strategy itself points out that states and cities must be organized to recognize and deal with meth. Yet it totally fails to mention the Drug-Free Communities Program, which has been very successful in addressing meth issues. 
Communities with existing anti-drug coalitions can identify and combat meth problems quickly and before they attain crisis proportions. Coalitions throughout the country have effectively responded to the meth crisis and have seen reductions in its use. For example, the Salida Build a Cult Generation Coalition in Salida, Colorado, used local school survey data to ascertain that meth was a problem in their community. Compared to monitoring the future data for the same time period, their community's rate of lifetime meth use for 10th graders was 61.9% above the national rate. As a result of implementing a multi-sector approach, the Salida Coalition has contributed to a 59% reduction in meth use among 10th graders from 13.9% in 2004 to 5.7% in 2006. School-based prevention should also be a vital component of any comprehensive strategy to deal with meth. Where meth is identified as an issue, schools have incorporated meth education into their existing evidence-based programs. The Safe and Drug-Free Schools and Communities program has contributed to significant reductions in meth use among school-aged youth in many states hit by the meth epidemic. For example, in Idaho, the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program contributed to a decrease of 51.9% in lifetime meth use among 12th graders, from 10.4% in 1996 to 5% in 2004. In addition, the 20% governor set aside from this program has been used to address meth. For example, Washington State has used their set aside to develop meth action teams in every county in the state. Communities and schools must have effective prevention infrastructures in place to be able to address meth and prescription drug abuse. Media campaigns and student drug testing are beneficial but not sufficient to provide the stable and effective community-wide prevention systems required to implement data-driven programs and strategies to deal with all of a community's drug issues, including meth. As my testimony has shown, communities with these capabilities have actually beaten back their meth problems among school-aged youth before they reached crisis proportions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Brooks? <clears throat> Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, Congresswoman Watson, thank you for inviting me to discuss the synthetic drug control strategy. This strategy is a welcome development for the administration, but on behalf of the 62,000 law enforcement officers I represent, as the president of the National Narcotic Officers Association's coalition, I have concerns about serious shortcomings which may put this laudable, the laudable goals of this strategy in jeopardy. This strategy is an important first step, but why did it take so long for ONDCP to prepare it? Why weren't more partners consulted in its development? The strategy is not supported by original and meaningful recommendations for action. Without action, and more importantly, without buy-in from key stakeholders, the synthetic drug control strategy is in danger of becoming irrelevant before it has a chance to succeed. In 1995, California was inundated with meth. After I alerted DEA and ONDCP leadership, they convened a series of stakeholder meetings that resulted in the first methamphetamine strategy by the Department of Justice. Collaboration continued and progress was being made on the West Coast, but meth was slowly creeping eastward. As meth began to overrun mid, uh, the Midwest and Appalachia, by 2001, collaboration with ONDCP began to wane. By 2004, groups across the country were calling for help from Congress, and Congress responded to their constituents by drafting the Combat Meth Act, which passed earlier this year. While the ON, uh, NNOAC and other key stakeholders worked closely with Congress to refine and pass this legislation, ONDCP was absent. I personally heard compla complaints from staff that they could not get assistance from ONDCP despite repeated attempts to obtain their support. Attorney General Gonzalez broke the administration's silence on meth on July 18, 2005, when he said, in terms of uh, damage to children and to our society, meth is now the most dangerous drug in America. Shortly thereafter, an o ONDCP spokesperson wrote off the focus on meth by saying that people are crying meth because it's a hot new drug. Of course, people were crying meth, but those of us in law enforcement, treatment and prevention knew that we were facing a problem that was growing worse by the day. Cops, doctors, treatment providers, DAs, child protective agencies, and community coalitions were being overwhelmed by meth problems in many parts of our nation. They weren't crying meth just to make noise. They were asking for help. ONDCP not only ignored them, they even tried to tell them that they didn't really have a problem. This is inexcusable, Mr. Chairman, and this synthetic drug control strategy continues to reflect ONDCP's disregard for the experience and perspective of the experts on the ground. 
If the NNOAC had been consulted by ONDCP, we would have made the following recommendations. Support law enforcement task forces that have seized thousands of meth labs by fully funding the Burn Justice Assistance Grant Program at the currently authorized $1.1 billion level. Fund the COPS Methamphetamines Hotspots Program, which has provided resources to hard-hit areas to train, equip, and mobilize law enforcement resources to address the meth issues. Call on Congress to authorize the Center for Task Force Training at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which provides much-needed training for drug task force commanders and meth investigators. Ensure that the OSADF Fusion Center, Center is coordinated with regional information sharing systems and the Haida Intel Centers, and ensure that the OSADF Fusion Center follows the guidelines of the National Criminal Intelligence Sharing Plan, which was implemented by the Department of Justice. State and local drug task forces funded through Burn were responsible for seizing 5,400 meth labs in 2004 alone. How effective is a strategy that establishes lab seizures as a goal and then takes away funding from the burn funded task forces that make a large percentage of those seizures? Law less law enforcement equals fewer labs seized. That's not success, it's surrender. The strategy states that the administration will continue to partner with state, county, tribal, and city governments over the next three years to attack the illicit use of methamphetamine. Yet the administration has proposed in the past two years to disengage from state and local partnerships by recommending termination of key assistance and training programs such as Burn JAG, COPS Hotspots, and the Center for Task Force Training. Paying lip service to the importance of federal, state, and local law enforcement partnerships without putting resources and actions behind the words is a recipe for a failed synthetic drug control strategy. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I've always believed that treatment, education, and prevention hold the keys to reducing America's drug problem. As long as drug traffickers ply their trade, narcotic officers will be there to stop them. Clinically appropriate treatment must be made available, but stopping use before it starts should be our ultimate goal. The things I have seen meth addicts do to themselves and to others would make members of the subcommittee cringe. Collectively, we must do all we can to prevent first use, but the synthetic strategy fails to address prevention in a comprehensive way. Community anti-drug coalitions are critical. Effective school-based anti-drug curriculum is important. Aggressive enforcement against drug producers and traffickers is absolutely essential. ONDCP has had an opportunity to really step up to the plate by issuing this strategy. I'm truly disappointed that it provides little new strategic direction to address the meth problem. I'm hoping that with the continued leadership of this subcommittee, the strategy will be rethought in a collaborative environment with input from all of the key constituents and that a new, more robust, well thought out synthetic drug control strategy will be the result. Thank you. Well, when your panel starts out with the Association of Counties saying, had we been consulted, and finishes with the narcotics officers saying, had we been consulted, uh, you're, you're less uh, impressed with the uh, first panel's assertion that you were consulted. Uh, that um, Let me ask a, a, a broad question, because I'm kind of um, uh, confused that in, in uh, Mr. Burns' testimony, I felt it was very significant that the administration says they don't do strategies by uh, subgroups. In other words, we kind of have a, a general. I'm trying to figure out from a, uh, a, a private business uh, approach uh, that normally what you would have is a, a sweeping national strategy of things that are in common. But I can't hardly imagine that you wouldn't have a sub-strategy that would have two, either in two different ways uh, or different components that relate different ways. So first, why wouldn't you have a cocaine strategy, a heroin strategy, a prescription drug strategy, a meth strategy, a marijuana strategy uh, that would then take into account some fundamental things that we're hearing here, for example, Cocaine is not everywhere, but it certainly is concentrated as a major drug, and it tends to be more urban. Uh, crack tends to be historically younger, but, uh, but 
I, I don't know. I mean, we have the intelligence center that does a lot of this kind of stuff. But heroin is a super huge problem in some cities like Seattle historically and less in others to, to varying degree. And then we have it pop up as it did a few years ago in Plano and Orlando or, or different types of things. Oxycontin will, will pop up in different areas. Why wouldn't you have then tailored strategies that fit inside your national strategy as a regular course of doing business. Also, the Haidas uh, in the law enforcement side were meant to kind of be regionalized because some of these problems are regional. So if meth pops up as a, a challenge, you would have uh, Haidas that, that dealt with meth. Um, that uh, I, I'm kind of baffled by a principle that says we don't break these out and then work in subgroups. And let me ask one follow-up uh, with this. I thought, I made a kind of a, a derogatory comment about conferences. I'm not against conferences, and, and uh, uh, I just uh, t couldn't believe that that was the primary strategy. On the other hand, Ms. Green, you outlined some of what the purpose of these conferences were, which is hopefully to get very specific on state, what's needed at state level, what's needed in coordination. Why wouldn't that be done before you issued a strategy? In other words, isn't that what you would think you would do in, as you approach cocaine, as you approach meth, as you approach each of these type of things, that there would be regional efforts to pull together the principles and wherever these are problems? You'd get them together and say, what laws do we have on this? What are you doing at the local level? What more can we do at the federal level? What funding sources do you need? Why wouldn't you do what they're proposing to do after they issued the strategy before you develop as a process of developing a strategy and why wouldn't you be doing this on multiple drugs? Would you for, yes. bit for me that yes. question? I'll go on to the floor and I can take it in writing. But uh, in listening to this panel on the ground, those of you who are on the ground, it occurs to me, uh, is there an opportunity to evaluate and assess the various programs that are being described by the administration. You know, do they work? What are the best practices? And I listened very intently to you, Ms. Green. I think you came closer to my concerns. Uh, and Mr. Coleman, uh, as heading up an organization in Northern California, I'd like to hear from you as to what actually is going on in various areas of our state, largest in the union, and what is working? And uh, Mr. Brooks, uh, what do we need in terms of law enforcement? What kind of coordination? Because I join my colleagues, you know, we sit here in Washington and we come up with these plans. You know, we have a vision for where we want to go. But it seems to be a disconnect when it gets down to the local communities. And I find my community void of the resources and the programs. Uh, you know, we work through our counties in California and they are not funded to the point they should be to address these programs. So my general question, Mr. Chairman, is there some way to evaluate the plans that are coming from the administration, the HIDA program and all these others, so that we then can come back and make decisions as it uh, deals with appropriating funds to some specific local communities, uh, their programs. So I just throw that out. You can respond uh, in writing. This is who I am. And uh, these are broad general concerns that I have about this whole uh, synthetic drug control program. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go on to the floor. Thank you. Ms. Green, you were? Uh... Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The um process that you described, if one were to use a rational and logical process for determining what would be the components of a particular strategy, you would follow the, the particular process that you outlined. Because the purpose of understanding the particular uh, action plans and recommendations and problems and concerns that are going on at the very state and local level is to determine when you do a strategy what it is that is common in terms of overall themes, what is different, as you indicated, because that difference can be among drugs, it can be among counties, it can be in localities. All of those would have to be taken into consideration. And then what happens is all of that information helps you determine what the overall themes are. Those become the common principles of the overall strategy.
than you do in very specific action steps and action plans lay out what needs to be done to address the particular differences between the drugs, the particular differences between the systems. That would be the rationale. Um, we have not actually been very successful in persuading ONDCP that they should follow a particular rational process in developing a strategy. We often don't have the opportunity because we have actually never been consulted in terms of the national drug strategy at all. We do model state drug laws, and part of our process is actually to assess how these laws are working, are they working, are there similarities among the different kinds of laws, are there different options that can have the same theme but maybe vary based upon the needs of the state. Do states listen to you? Yes, actually. We work with, at any given, uh, yeah, we work with, at any given time, about three different states, and we work with all 50 states on over 40 different drug and alcohol issues. Mr. Cummings wanted to make it. Yeah, just very briefly, I want to first of all thank all of you for your uh, testimony. I think it was um, uh, good that you had an opportunity to sit in the audience and hear uh, the folks that came before you. I'm also glad that you had an opportunity to hear an amendment on the floor uh, which said that um, ONDCP should work with and collaborate with uh, folks on the ground. That's incredible. Um, and we're going to continue to do what we can because we realize, again, we're trying to be, we're trying to figure out, I tell people, you know, we don't have but so long to be on this earth. And we don't have time and we don't have time to waste money. And if you all are on the ground, and you're facing these, you're dealing with these kinds of things on a daily basis in whatever arenas you may be in, it just makes sense to be all of us working together to achieve these goals in um, some kind of way. I just want to thank you all for your willingness to, to come to the table. And now we just have to get the other folks to come to the table so that we can achieve the things that we need to achieve. But again, I want to thank you. And I'll have some follow-up questions, but I'll put those in writing. Uh, subcommittee will stand in uh, recess uh, for this vote. Uh, I plan to reconvene for a couple of additional questions. Thanks. assurances of as to um, I mean I've been I've been to many conferences and some conferences you go and hear speakers and then it's kind of laissez-faire how you apply it and then other uh, conferences you go and there at the end of the day there are resolutions uh, that tend to be almost like us trying to negotiate a bill going to the floor um, depending on how diverse the group is. And then there are other times where it's, you have, uh, you know, it's almost like you have to have a pre-conference group that sets out some things that are more specific that can move to an action plan. Uh, 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 Ms. Green, you, you outlined in your testimony fairly specific goals for the conference that uh, I, I didn't, uh, hear the same specific specificity out of the ONDCP. On the other hand, we didn't ask him precisely the same question. Do you believe, uh, and do the others believe, that there is a way to structure these such that we can, in fact, uh, get a more specific and effective uh, kind of uh, 
regional plans and specific state plans? Uh, uh, or basically, will this just be a verification of those states that are organized? Indiana's been getting organized. Hawaii's been organized for quite a while. Uh, how do you see this evolving, and how can we make sure that it then gets somehow assimilated into a very mm -hmm. specific national plan where the things, the threads that are in common that are national, such as crystal meth coming across the border, need for certain type of treatments, can be nationalized, and things that are regionalized and implemented at regional can be regionalized. Uh, I'd like the input of any anyone here uh, and uh, on uh, do you sense that ONDCP is committed to having more than a hand-holding conference? And secondly, how can we make it such that it has specific plans? Mr. Chairman, I'll start since we are the ones that the three agencies, the Justice Department, ONDCP, and then HHS have asked to conduct these conferences. Uh, do I believe there is a way to make these conferences productive and to have them come out with very specific action plans? Yes, uh, precisely because of the very specific process that I outlined. Now, the key to that process, though, is to have those individuals who actually know specifically what is going on at the state and local level can identify the concerns, can identify what is actually working, can identify particular gaps that they're seeing and to put that information together. Now, the key to that is that all of the individuals that are on this panel with me are actually going to be involved in those particular conferences. At the same time, we're going to hold four of them in different regions. At the same time, we are working with certain evaluation and certain specialists, such as Dr. Carnivali, who has a specialty in being able to help identify certain common themes and certain um, specific differences that may, for example, apply to one region for example, the southeast region, which is more a preventive mode as opposed to the western region, uh, which has actually got a great deal of experience on more issues such as clean remediation of meth labs. So we have a group of state and locals that are going to actually discuss very specific needs, goals, what is happening, what is not happening, what is working, what is not working. They're going to talk to us about the information that they actually have that indicates successes or positive benefits. Some of the type of information that I suggest in my testimony we can't get from the federal level. And then we're going to work again with a group of individuals who um, have a base of experience in looking at that information and being able to help assess what does that mean in terms of similarities, common themes. Now, as to do I believe that ONDCP is committed? My experience is that ONDCP has never committed to action. ONDCP is primarily committed to being able to say what they need to say to try to be able to either check mark something that they believe that they're committed to do. Uh, but when it comes to co <laughs> me believing that they're actually committed to action, I'd have to say historically I've never actually seen that. Individuals within ONDCP, for example, Scott Burns, yes, I believe he's committed to action, but since he is not the drug czar at this current moment, um, I couldn't tell you that my experience with ONDCP under this particular uh, drug czar's office suggests that they're going to commit to any action. Um, now, one of the things we were doing to offset what I perceive may happen, which may be an attempt to either try to sanitize what comes out of it or somehow the information to inadvertently get lost, um, my staff and I are actually going to put together the information, work with, as I said, Dr. Connor Wally and others to see what it says. We are going to retain that information so that we can disseminate it to all the federal, state, and local policymakers and our partners so that everyone is very clear about what is coming out of these. Mr. Brooks? I would have to agree. And I, I want to start by saying that, first of all, they did this all backwards. I mean, the conferences should have come before the strategy. In the old days, when we developed the National Drug Control Strategy or the first meth control strategy out of DOJ with DEA and ONDCP, we came together, we had plenary sessions with experts, and then we broke into groups and we developed action plans in really robust, facilitated focus groups that represented all of the key constituencies, parents groups, treatment, uh, the, the law, the lawyer side of the house, the, the cops, um, uh, everybody. And then we came up with strategies. These were true collaborative strategies where people bought in uh, as real stakeholders, where they, had, where they had a feeling of ownership and were then able to go out and implement strategies. And had ONDCP done that, which, which they haven't, this, this administration and ONDCP has never done. Uh, they don't hold key constituent meetings. We have never had focus groups and constituent meetings to develop the national drug control strategy uh, or this strategy or the southwest border strategy 
uh, the, the, the newly emerging fentanyl threat is being driven by the Haida directors in the Chicago and Philadelphia police departments, uh, not by ONDCP as it should. And, and let me add by saying that ONDCP, I was, I was cornered in the hallway and they were, they were outraged at my testimony, my written statement, because I, I uh, affirmed that they had not been collaborative. And they said, well, we sent an email to the Haida directors. And I said, you know, an, an email without knowing what you're working on or where it is coming from, uh, a, a simple one email traffic is not a collaborative process. When we sit down with all of the stakeholders, the people in this panel, uh, and, and all of the groups that they represent, that would be a collaborative process. That would have been a strategy that we and you could buy into, um, but, but they didn't do it. Any other comments on that? Mr. Cole? Do you have a comment, Mr. Cole? Yes, I do. Um, we think what the ON, ONDCP did was put the cart before the horse. They should have had the, the, uh, the meth summits prior to to uh, listen to what was coming out of, out of them. Now, the counties will be involved in the summits, in which we're looking at a, a, a regional plan and out of that coming a, a national plan, in which we'll be addressing this problem. But to uh, come out with all these plans without the stakeholders to uh, being involved uh, doesn't help, uh, doesn't solve the problem, it only creates a problem. And then when you don't put the money with it, uh, it also creates an additional problem. So we're looking forward to the, the summits. We will be involved in that, and we will come up with a national plan. It's uh, pretty massive when you look at all the different uh, uh, narcotics and you look at all uh, the um, different challenges and the regional variations. But uh, um, that one of the you know one of the things is is uh, with, with meth that was so unusual is is that we could see it coming. And that's what's so exasperating here is now we're kind of uh, uh, maybe at at least at a flattening, if not a decline, in the mom and pop labs. Uh, but uh, I remember years ago the Asians uh, in our uh, international narcotics uh, legislators, anti-narcotics legislators groups, raising synthetic drugs, and the Europeans and the South Americans and the North Americans basically going, well, we, we don't even know really what you're particularly talking about at, at this point, um, but in Hawaii they did. So they have a long tracking record in Hawaii, and then it hits our West Coast, and it just marches. And that um, uh, in a hearing in Minnesota, I asked if it had uh, been in any of the Native American Areas and they said it's devastating them, and yet that had never come up as a subcategory. That that um, uh, what I heard from the uh, U.S. attorney who works with the northern uh, U.S. Uh, Indian nations that it had become a bigger problem in alcohol. Well, that's a pretty extraordinary statement for the the government not to be. Uh, aggressively and saying this isn't a national problem my lands if it's in the Indian nations and then there was this mythology that developed that somehow uh, I literally heard this at two different hearings out of the federal government more in a speculative as to why this was in rural areas and not urban areas that somehow African Americans wouldn't be attracted to meth and then in one uh, uh, in, in uh, Minneapolis the uh, a police chief there, I believe, said that in one neighborhood, the particular distribution group switched over, and all of a sudden, 20% uh, of the cases in that city were African American because one neighborhood switched over from crack and it, to, to crystal meth, and it appeared to be more of a distribution question. Well, that's a pretty fundamental misunderstanding in, in, the, in the federal government to not uh, uh, understand the distribution patterns of how, how meth uh, uh, goes and I'm just uh, Dr. Galan. I saw you were going to add something here too in these conferences, but I'm wondering whether um, uh, what kind of early warning system we have uh, for future things uh, when uh, the we talk about Chicago, Phila Philadelphia. Some of these things pop up and you can get them down quick enough, but this one was like if a train that's been rolling for over a decade. Well, in terms of Early warning, I think one of the things that uh, our federal partners, particularly SAMHSA, can do is to put into place early warning systems that are current. Uh, many of the early warning systems they have currently are, are dated. You know, they go back 20, 30 years and really haven't 
caught up with what we're facing today. So a national strategy to get data, current data, usable data, rather than just collect data based on some mythology from the past or some issue from the past that currently doesn't exist, I think needs to be addressed. For, for, drug, for drug treatment and health questions, uh, wouldn't we, that, that much of the surveys I see and so on often are like three years old. They, they'll be 2001, 2002, 2003, and you're in 2006 trying to make legislative funding priorities. Um, and that's helpful because that data will be more comprehensive, plus we have trend lines on, on some of that. Right. But why wouldn't that in a logical way be supplemented with, with almost in the days of, of Internet, instantaneous data on um, uh, emergency room, uh, drug court, uh, th which are two frontline groups. Another would be uh, what we're picking up on the border on a daily basis. In other words, uh, that it's, it's not like we're not accounting for this when the uh, Department of Homeland Security picks this up. If, if, our, if our suppositions are correct, and that after certain states in the Southwest started to enact pseudo-federal law, we should have seen if crystal meth is coming in the United States, and if in fact uh, 67 to 80 percent of meth is um, uh, crystal meth, and if it's coming across the Southwest border, and if we're actually intercepting anything, which is debatable, but, but if we are intercepting things, uh, we should have seen a bump up, and it should have been almost instantaneous data, that when a policeman makes arrest on the street, um, that data gets fed into to Epic. Uh, it, it's like, why can't you have kind of an ongoing, kind of daily tracking, which presumably some are, drug intelligence center and Epic do, but it doesn't seem to get to us. What we tend to get in our hearings are historical data. Any comments on whether you see more contemporary things than we see here? Well, I think um, again, the the issue, the fentanyl issue, is a great example. Uh, as fentanyl began to hit, as, as there was a seizure of fentanyl coming across the border in San Diego, uh, the San Diego height of the sea bag issued the first bulletin, uh, went out to law enforcement and to ONDCP. Uh, we started to see fentanyl deaths first in Chicago and then in Philadelphia and then in the Midwest, uh, in the Kansas City area. And uh, bulletins began coming out and it was, it were, was those uh, uh, emergency medical personnel and law enforcement and treatment folks in those cities that began to collaborate. So I think things do happen regionally. Um, NDIC has just come out with an excellent fentanyl bulletin uh, out to law enforcement that is addressing the threat. And this is a breaking, emerging trend. Uh, so things do happen, but there becomes a disconnect. And it is really a shame, I think, that ONDCP is not the coordinator of pushing out uh, this data because they can get it out to all the constituent groups, to all the prevention folks, to the community coalitions, to the law enforcement. Uh, but, but there is a disconnect there. Do you get, do you get information as to why Chicago and Philadelphia? Um, it, you know what, it, I, we're only surmising uh, that uh, there are some distribution groups that had the ability, that were in place there, that had the ability to bring uh, this fentanyl from labs in Mexico uh, we believe anecdotally that the labs are in Mexico. Now, we have seen uh, domestic labs in this country, fentanyl labs. We struggled with a tough fentanyl problem in California in the mid-'80s. Uh, I, I personally raided two fentanyl labs in, in back in those days. Uh, but we believe now it's coming out of Mexico. Uh, these tend to be controlled by drug, by DTOs and families, and, and so it's probably just where they ended up. Now, it's interesting. We just had... Uh, three overdoses of fentanyl in a California prison, uh, one death, uh, two recovered. Uh, so somehow the fentanyl made its way in that prison, but we have not been, we have not seen fentanyl on the street in California yet. But I can tell you that uh, every single day, uh, the HIDA directors are communicating by email, uh, not only with our, ourselves, but with all of the law enforcement partners that we represent every day as this fentanyl crisis is emerging. Ms. Thai, I want to ask you a, um, a a couple of questions leading to one broad one, but on the community anti-drug coalitions, do you get, um, you're in how, how many are there? Over There's well over 100 now, how many? Oh, nationwide there's yeah. about, how many, Kelly? Uh, Drug-free communities funded are like 1,000. We have about 5,000 members. Yeah, 5,000 members, 1,000 are funded now through NDCP because mm -hmm. 
it kept accelerating as it went. Now, in that thousand, um, uh, do you get access to this kind of information of what's happening regionally? Well, we get access to them as far as what's going on in their coalitions. We actually collect the data, which is how we came up with the outcomes to put in this package. But like if fentanyl all of a sudden pops up in two markets, you would see your data collection pop up? Would that there be They adjusted? would because they have police and law enforcement. All Every single one of these coalitions has law enforcement sitting there for exactly that reason. Because if you're going to comprehensively look at what you're doing in a community, you have to talk to your emergency room people. You have to have police at the table. And the school survey data is maybe every two years. But th the point I was going to make is the stuff that you hear from the federal government is monitoring the future, which is a survey sample nationally, which masks all of the richness of what's happening in regions and specific communities in the country. And that's probably why they haven't seen it, because they're not looking at what communities and states are looking at, which is their data. And as you know, the data issue is that a lot of these federal agencies, like Safe and Drug-Free Schools, don't even ask for the data from the states, and the states have it. The states that have had big meth issues have seen, as we said, higher usage rates among their students than states that didn't have a big meth issue. So the states and the communities get it, but it's never aggregated up to the point that it comes to you, other than these national samples that mask all of the variation in local and regional data. In the community anti-drug uh, initiative, um, uh, you're not limited just to youth. No. Um, the uh, One of the things that came up in the national ad campaign as we addressed meth, and in your testimony you showed kind of the introductory process of uh, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, cocaine, and, and, and how, the age, how the process ages. Our national ad campaign is, is geared towards uh, youth. Mm -hmm. The theory was is that if we tackle kind of right at the current time it's marijuana, everything else will be controlled. Um, how do we do a post-analysis to say um, uh, that strategy failed? In other words, it, that it's hard to say how much it failed because, in fact, marijuana use was going down, yet a methamphetamine epidemic would hit a community and wipe it out, regardless of whether the kids had gone through safe and drug-free schools, had the other things uh, uh, or not. And yet our ad campaign was just focused on below 18, we suddenly have a problem that's devastating our local drug task forces, uh, our hospitals, everything, uh, drug courts, everything else are overwhelmed when it hit a market. And yet we say, well, we addressed this back when they were 16. Um, how do, do you have any thoughts on, on whether or not our policy in many areas in, in prevention, drug-free schools would be one example and a national youth ad campaign doesn't really uh, tackle the the richness of this assumption. I've asked these questions for years because I have a theory that the reason we went to youth campaigns was not just to prevent it at an early age. It's because it's easier to get kids to agree than it is to get adults to agree. And that it was the ease of having the kids go, yes, I think drugs are terrible, and then we move it down farther because it, uh, and yet the tough ages are junior high and into right. high school, and it gets even tougher when you're dealing with somebody on an assembly line, a woman is trying to lose weight, and they want to use methamphetamine. Uh, they don't necessarily remember back in fifth grade. Uh, how, how do we, any thoughts on, on, mm -hmm. on, on this subject? Yes. We, and, and for example, why weren't the community anti-drug coalitions just oriented towards youth? If this whole thing could be solved if we addressed youth, you obviously, when you work with the development of this program, wanted to go beyond youth. Well, ONDCP, it's focused on youth, however, it's community-wide. And what we know is that drug trends do start in using populations, but then they go down, like ecstasy started in an older population and ended up in high school kids. Part of the issue is what you said before about how do you do a strategy. One, do you need basic prevention for everybody? Yeah. Do you need then to hit specifically specific drugs within that? You do. You can do the base prevention, but if we know that risk, perception of risk and social disapproval for specific drugs is what drives the trends on those, you can't just think that general drug prevention that is going gonna, is gonna to totally do it. You have to build into it components for the emerging drug trends as they're coming up, and you have to be very cognizant of what age groups are using what substances. 
Any other thoughts on this? Uh, uh, the um, do you do you see? I, I wanted to touch one, on one other point with with treatment and uh, Dr. Gallant, uh, and we've heard multiple witnesses, and including in my opening statement, say that the mythology developed that meth. Uh, uh, there wasn't really a good treatment for meth. Part of the way this mythology developed, quite frankly, because sometimes we hold up that the grassroots is, is all-knowing, it came from the grassroots, because I've conducted at least 10 hearings on meth, and I've had at least five hearings where treatment experts testified at regional level that meth was different in treatment, that it was hard to treat, unsolvable to treat, that uh, local places. This was, this was not some kind of mythology developed in Congress. This was a mythology that developed at the grassroots. Um, are, are you telling me that uh, meth it can be treated like any other drug, that it's harder, easier to treat? It's like what? Um, because it's important if we're going to clarify the record here to try to figure out how to clarify the record. Uh, we do believe that uh, meth can be treated like any other drug, but one of the distinct differences in meth is duration of treatment. And I think as uh, Congresswoman Watson pointed out, when she went to the one program that uh, she felt uh, might have some, some value for her niece, it was a long-term program of uh, up to 24 months, individualized for the person entering the program. So the feature we found with meth is that it's such a, a powerful drug, it's such an addictive drug, that in order to get the person clean and sober and into recovery, it takes much longer than for some of the other drugs that our system uh, encounters. I, b I believe it was in your testimony that you uh, listed um, some of these uh, uh, drug programs that had the... Um, Colorado, Tennessee. Yeah, and, and I think one of them said in Utah... Um, if I remember, yeah, Utah, that 60.8 percent of methamphetamine users were abstaining at their point of discharge, which means that 40 percent were still using meth at discharge. True. Is that at some level? Is that um, uh, is that indicative more of what you were saying about the length of time that they may have had short programs, or that they uh, because you at, at discharge could discharge in that case also mean that they were expelled from the program or withdrew from the program. They could it have is, left. It, it's uh, without. not completion of a program. Right. So um, uh, that that helps me understand that figure because there's a wide range. Some had had you know where you have 80 percent after six months. That's a different standard than. Uh, but with the with the word discharge, which you used in your testimony in a number of 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 places, is discharge usually mean that the person, would that include withdrawal? And when you say, uh, so let's, let me, I'm trying to sort out the, the, the data here, right. in, in, because you kind of had apples and oranges mixed here, and I'm just trying to compare them. If Utah had a 60% in the their state division uh, who were absent at the time of discharge, that would mean everybody who entered the program, including those who withdrew, uh, failed, were kicked out, uh, maybe it was voluntary people who, who left, um, then if you say uh, in Tennessee that 65 percent um, were abstinent six months after treatment, that wouldn't necessarily, in, those would be probably people who completed the program and then 65 percent, because it wouldn't. Do you know of any surveys that surveyed the people that dropped out in trying to measure whether people are impacted afterwards? It's usually if they've completed the program when they do the measurement. Right. Uh, the data that we presented probably would not include those who dropped out uh, and did not um, have a positive outcome. And in the data that you presented, and I know these are difficult questions because they're there. You in the testimony prepared a few examples and didn't examine all the subcomponents of that. But with, with this data that you had for Colorado, Idaho in the written testimony, Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, which ranges from the kind of the uh, ex extremes of 60, only 60% 60 in effect being abstinent 
uh, who were, went in uh, in statewide in all treatment to uh, 80 uh, some percent being abstinence uh, at discharge, which is at 60, 80, Colorado, uh, Utah, to uh, 73 percent six months after in Minnesota. Um, is is that comparable to the range of type of things we would see if this survey had been cocaine? Um, probably. What we are trying to demonstrate there is that treatment is effective and it is in effect, it's effective long range. At discharge, the person determine if they had reverted to use. The data suggests that they had not reverted to use, that they were clean six months post-discharge from the program as a success. As we move towards our, our treatment hearing, one of the questions that, that uh, because I'm sure at least somebody from your association will be involved in that, if, if not you directly, um, could you look and see how this data that you ha have been collecting on meth, how that compares to other drugs, and if it's substantially different? meaning substantially variation, minimum 5%, 10% uh, uh, would be, be pretty significant. If it's, if it's uh, by 10% different, I mean an actual 10% range, that'd be more like 15% actual over the top. If it's significantly uh, uh, different, because we know there's going to be differences, just because we've, we're, it, it's newer and some states were farther along, some states are more rural than urban, uh, uh, what they pay their treatment people. I understand all the variations. That's why a normal statistical difference might be five. I'm looking for a lot more than five. If there are statistical differences <clears throat> in meth uh, effectiveness uh, from cocaine, heroin, marijuana, other drugs, uh, then secondly, whether that gap has closed uh, in the last few years, uh, because SAMHSA has been looking at um, doing more directed meth treatment and then if it if it there is a gap and it's not closing is part of what I suggested earlier part of this problem that rural uh, treatment facilities do not uh, where many of the meth addicts are uh, are, are not there and it, in fact it isn't a treatment question it's that the longer term higher professional more expensive treatment is not available in the areas where the meth is because if in fact it's the same then my premise that there was a difference in rural health care from urban health care wouldn't really be there in other words if if in fact you're finding right now that meth treatment is just as effective uh, as cocaine treatment then we don't really need to look at whether we need special programs in rural meth treatment because in fact it's working as well as everything else if there's a gap then we need to figure out whether we need to do something particularly for meth and that's going to be one of the main focuses of our hearing what what unique challenges are there because if the data is, is good that's where you go look you don't need to customize every strategy right. if if there are certain basic principles that work uh, if length of time is the major variable if it's if it's uh, training of the individual now we we've, we've had a lot of testimony particularly at, from grassroots providers, that meth seizes the body differently uh, and that it has different impact on the brain. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that. And uh, so that's why the treatment would be longer? Well, again, uh, I think the addictive properties of meth are such that it, you know, just sort of wraps the person up in order to get the person clean takes a longer length of stay than you might find with other drugs. But to answer your other question about rural versus urban, one of the things that we know we have to attend to, and if we're not, is workforce development, development and provider development. You know, we can get all the work, money in the world, but if you don't have a competent workforce to deliver the service, regardless of wherever they are, you're not going to achieve your objective. So our goal as an association is to ensure that we work with SAMHSA and HHS to ensure that we have a, a good solid provider development program, a good solid workforce development program. They have two mechanisms in place currently that allow them to get to that. One is the addiction technology transfer centers and the other is the uh, centers for the application of prevention technologies. They're underfunded. Uh, they need, you know, if, if, you know, I think the ATTs are funded at about $11 million. That's not a good workforce strategy. You can't adequately cover 
the country with a workforce strategy involving 11 million bucks. So our goal is to look at getting more competent workforce in place, having a variety of mechanisms to do that, uh, you know, not only through conferences, but basic education, community colleges, uh, secondary, you know, uh, universities, graduate school programs to help folk who want to enter this field get into it and get the skill sets they need to be competent in their work. And then for providers, providers sometimes get into this business thinking that they want to do good but don't have the ability to run a business. So we need to help them understand how you run a business, how you access funding, how you write a grant, how you hire people, and how you manage a facility. Those, those are basic tenets of trying to run a good business, and that's one thing that our system currently does not pay a lot of attention to. Let me uh, uh, finish with a uh, series of questions around this uh, subject, because having worked with this for a long time, it, it, it's really reared its head in the meth question, and that is, is that how do you deal with the different intensity of impacts of some drugs versus other drugs? And the um, in even within that drug, a disproportionate impact from one type of that drug versus the other. So let me give you, let me relate this particularly. Part of the reason the politics of this are different, and it isn't the politics just at the federal level. There's no question that the most important, significant thing in moving us to a national mess strategy was a National Association of County survey, and we can never thank you enough because by nationalizing it. Um, through your county organizations uh, and surveying them and having them respond, which if there's ever a doubt that at a local level that a survey like this or the input works, this one did because we constantly heard it was a regional question. It's a regional question. Yeah, but you know what? If you add up every region, it's a national question. The only place that wasn't there really was New England, and now we're learning that Florida has much more of a problem than they thought that they had, and, and they were supposedly in the southeast didn't have much, uh, but as it's rolling around, we find out, well, they did. They just weren't paying as much of it. Uh, it wasn't as big a focus because part of the difference here was the mom-and-pop labs uh, so devastated our drug infrastructure that the impact of the narcotic became, you know, we would have a, a regional hearing, and I could see the crowd get restless every time DEA said the basic same testimony that two-thirds, which is now they say 80 percent, is crystal meth. And the local community get all restless. First off, they, they wouldn't necessarily see the crystal meth as much, but the, the mom and pop, the Nazi lab type things, would, would tie up your local drug force so that you couldn't even find out whether you had crystal meth, you couldn't find out whether you had crack, you couldn't find out whether you had marijuana because your drug task force in one of my counties was sitting there six, eight hours at a house so they couldn't pick up anybody else. And, and so it had a disproportionate impact on our ability of our drug task forces to, to work. That we would go into a community in uh, Ramsey County is one that sticks out, but I know uh, Lee Terry told me similar things happen in Omaha. We heard similar testimony in, in uh, Oregon that when meth would hit a community in the mom and pop labs, which would tend to be picked up first because local law enforcement can't let these idiots explode the buildings in their towns, blow up uh, kids in the house and so on, uh, get ammonia and everything else uh, into the, the water in the community. So that obviously had to be a takedown. So they would take down those first. So the emergency room emissions uh, admissions were more likely to be mom and pop lab people tying up the emergency room because that's who the law enforcement were having to deal with. Because like in my area, they they catch a building on fire and, 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 and whatever. California was the first state that really had this in devastating, which led to their law. Now, that disproportionate impact, we'd heard in Ramsey County, then the next thing is that they went from a standing start to six months, 80% of the kids in child custody were meth users, from zero to 80% in six months, which meant that the child custody uh, program was overwhelmed because when you got some idiot cooker in this 
uh, in their ho home uh, with little kids present. You can't leave the little kids in there. Uh, that uh, So they're going to wind up in child custody. So all of a sudden, kids who are in child abuse homes, uh, conventional child abuse, don't have a place to go because 80% of your people uh, are being taken up with urgent <coughs> meth cases. Uh, that um, we heard in drug courts, in different cities, drug courts would go from 10 or 20% to all of a sudden 80%. Elkhart County in my district, the county, the jail, went from nothing to 90% being meth users, which meant that he couldn't, they, you can talk all you want about marijuana laws, but you can't arrest anybody for, mar for marijuana if your jail's full. Uh, you don't have any place to put them. I mean, you can give them a ticket or something, but you don't have any place to put them. You don't have any place to put uh, people who stole a car uh, because your jail's full of meth users. Now, my question is, is do we have an adequate way in our system to measure um, in our targeting that if something kind of rips the guts out of the system, uh, what's the point of us funding diverse drug task force if one drug is wiping out the drug task forces? Uh, if it's hitting the emergency rooms, if it's hitting the drug courts, and part of the political frustration here is the politicians understood that because if you're a county commissioner, you got to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, that the, the police, the narcotics officers were under this because they were standing at a house waiting for DEA or EPA to come over uh, forever to get there. And yet the political system was saying, well, it's only 4%. Who gives a rip if it's 4%? It's wiping out your budget. Uh, and, and that uh, uh, how do you suggest that we kind of incorporate into our national drug strategies intensity? Because that's really what we're talking about here, and that's why should there be a measure that uh, emergency, that, that I just gave you a series of variables that potentially could do that, but that seems to be some of what we're fencing around here is because when they unveiled their meth strategy, they came to the meth caucus, and told the meth caucus that problem's kind of under control, it's declining and so on, and it's like, where? Um, uh, it, it's certainly, even in my district, they'll say it's declining. Now instead of being 30% over budget on overtime, they're 10% over budget on overtime. I, instead of having 60 labs, they have 40 labs. Instead of not being able to get to all the meth people, they're now able to get to maybe 60% of it. But still, in, in Allen County, my home, which had had very little, uh, and in and multiple other counties, we're getting, and this comes to the treatment question, that, uh, well, in Noble County, that, that the prosecutor said he had one guy, he was up the third time, and he was still hadn't been sentenced by the judge for the first time. Now, there's, th this is what's driving the locals crazy, and when it, anybody who watches this saying, oh, well, meth seems to be getting under control, it's, uh, th there, it's not measuring the intensity of the impact that's this having on the child support system, on the local law enforcement system, on the jail capacity, uh, and, and that, that even if this declines 15%, 15% doesn't alleviate the pressure, unless the 15%, or 25%, I guess it was for mom and pop labs, I'm not sure 25% alleviates the pressure. It may be that, that we have to go 50% on the mom and pop labs, to, because if there's not an intensity measure here, it's just some kind of number we picked out of the sky. And I'm, I'm, I want to get your reactions to that. I, I know you basically agree with that, but as you go into these conferences, one of the questions is, is how do you pick up intensity? The, the fentanyl is an example. I mean, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of deaths. My lands, that's as many deaths it, but from one drug that nobody ever heard of that then you'll have in a, in a city with all the other drugs combined for that same period. How do you measure intensity, and how do we factor that into our planning? Well, I think one way we could do it to, is to um, work with SAMHSA and HHS to develop a national data system to collect data regarding uh, use, uh, intensity of use, and so forth. Right now, the block grant monies that come to states, we do provide client-level data, but that's the only federal money that comes to states that require client-level data. So you have a whole another set of uh, dollars coming out of the Justice Department, coming out of other agencies that don't collect or don't provide the single state authority data that they then can roll up to SAMHSA to give a national picture of use. So one of the recommendations I would have is that anyone receiving federal dollars should be required 
to link with the SSA to ensure that that SSA is collecting client-level data so we can get a whole picture of what's going on nationally regarding use. Uh, the other piece uh, that I think uh, would be good is to have data flow up. And the National Household Data Survey, I think, as pointed out by uh, Sue Thaw, really doesn't really give you uh, sub-state level indications of, of use. It gives you a national picture, but it doesn't allow you to say what's going on in the bowels of Iowa, what's going on in the counties of Indiana or the cities of Indiana. Uh, that can only be done by developing a system that allows state to take a, a real good snapshot of what's going on within their localities and then feed that data up to our federal partners to get a national picture. Yeah, because in Indiana, for example, I think we were fifth in labs, but really less than 20% uh, of the state uh, is impacted by meth labs. And in my own district, I have uh, uh, three of the major counties, and then I have two counties that don't have a single one, basically, or, or minimal, even in the same geographical area. And, and one county is next to another county. One county at, I think, 80 labs and the other county had zero labs and they're both rural counties next to each other uh, that that trying to understand the intensity of the panic and and how to deal with this is is one of our huge challenges mr. Coleman we agree with your statements mr. chairman we don't have uh, the answers um, in, in the numbers that you're looking uh, for but we would be willing to work with you we do know one thing it is affecting county budgets across this country untold the amount of uh, cases being heard in the drug courts is phenomenal. From one year to the next, it seems to be doubling and tripling. Yet, we're all looking for these answers, and, and we hope that working together as a collective group, we can come up with these answers and start addressing this problem immediately, not in 2011. And, it, and it's a challenge uh, that uh, isn't just meth. I was trying to address it as we look in the overall uh, drug strategy, because as, as you'll well uh, know that um, in the early 80s, crack is still a huge, and cocaine still is the biggest problem in my biggest city, uh, Fort Wayne, which is not that far from Detroit. And um, there was at one point where we were very high in, in uh, the number of crack houses, and crack was devastating the, the city of, of Fort Wayne. And literally, uh, the way we learned what, what was leading to this huge growth of gangs was in the, in the course of a, a, a the prosecutor and uh, uh, my then boss, uh, Congressman Coates, uh, we, we put together a thing where one of the things the prosecutor initiated was giving a urine test to the kids at the youth center, found that almost all of them were tested for crack. And it's like, crack? That was up in Detroit. That's not down in Fort Wayne, which then when they start to go through some of the gang kids, realize that there was a direct connection to some of the, the groups that were coming down. And at one point, there were 155 crack houses in, in the city of Fort Wayne. Now, that doesn't mean 155 working on a given night. What it means is there were uh, 155 houses where they were moving through that were abandoned in the urban area, which then often led to a reaction where you tear all that down and then you have all these vacancies and then people wonder why you can't get a grocery store to work in the community. And, and we've watched in our urban areas kind of this reaction and overreaction to you know, how you deal with those kind of drugs because there, when an intensity grabs a community, whether it's meth or whether it's cocaine or whether it's fentanyl, it has a disproportionate reaction. And unless we are, are reacting uh, to some degree to the topic at hand, uh, it, we're not relevant. And then we can't get buy into the overall narcotic strategy because people go, well, why are you doing that when I have this problem here? Because ultimately, you do have to have some threat of a national st strategy um, that, that is common with all this. You can't go jerk into whatever the drug is of the, the day. But if you don't have any responsiveness, local law enforcement goes, what are you doing? This isn't my problem. Any other comments on this or how you might uh, address it? Well, I, I don't know exactly how to address it, but I, but you've hit the nail on the head. There's really two meth problems in America. There's there's the the small toxic labs, which are really the face of meth. I mean, when when communities think of meth, they think of all of the medical and law enforcement and child protective services that are tied up uh, with with drug endangered children, with environmental uh, with environmental issues, with law enforcement issues. 
but uh, DEA and, and DOJ is probably correct. 80% of our meth probably is from large drug trafficking organizations, super labs in California, and now uh, increasingly more in Mexico. Um, and these are poly drug issues. I mean, when we buy uh, meth in California, uh, traditionally they'll say, okay, you want 50 pounds of meth, but you have to take three pounds of heroin and 10 kilos of coke because we're a poly, you know, because that's their business plan. Uh, so we can't, we can't lose sight of one problem for the other. And that's traditionally what it seems like we do is we chase our tail a little bit and we run around. And we, we have to be more flexible. And I think part of being more flexible and responsive, and that's my frustration in this synthetic drug control strategy, is the fact that nobody talked to the treatment docs, to the cops, to the community anti-drug coalitions, um, to the trial protective services workers. Because if you talk to them, you will have a pretty good picture of what's going on in America. You'll understand pretty much how we need to craft a strategy. And so if we stay, if we keep that in sight, and I think Congressman Cummings made the point earlier in his comments, that we have to talk to the people that are on the ground doing the job uh, and be able to respond immediately as we're responding to fentanyl. As we responded to meth in the early days in 95 and 96 as it became an emerging problem, when DEA uh, ramped up, uh, you know, you mentioned the uh, tribal lands uh, issue, and I, and I have to give uh, credit to the US DOJ, especially the Bureau of Justice Assistance. They have, are ramping up uh, training for, tri for tribal lands uh, meth issues. They have ramped up on the National Criminal Intelligence Sharing Plan and the risk projects that help us share all this information and work smarter. Uh, they are working on the CENTEF program that helps train us and let us work smarter. DEA is doing an outstanding job. Uh, the Office of State and Local Affairs at, at, at uh, ONDCP is working diligently with the HIDAs to do a good job. And, and the disconnect appears to be uh, at the leadership of ONDCP. Any other comments, Ms. Green? Um, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that would help, and it relates to everything we're saying, is to have an infrastructure, and, and again, this is not my forte, but in terms of the work that we do with all of our colleagues, <laughs> it would help to have an infrastructure that can actually pull information on a number of different variables, meth lab seizures, foster care placements, county budgets, treatment admissions, uh, community coalition information, and people who are qualified at a national level to review all of that information and uh, hopefully assess what that means in terms of intensity to the other impacts. Some of the things that we ran into early on when we were working on the meth issue is that some people would only focus on usage numbers and completely ignore the massive drain on system resources that were occurring in a number of the states. So rather than get into those particular fights involving resources, it would have been helpful to have someone who was actually pulling all this information and saying, well, look what's happening in treatment emissions, look what's happening on county budgets, lab seizures, look what's happening in schools. We never had that. And so we ended up with individuals, at least in our work at state and local levels, fighting over, well, usage numbers are really this. And yet we had, you know, Ron and his colleagues, and Sue and her colleagues, and Eric and his colleagues, um, and Dr. Glant and his colleagues saying, well, yes, but we're having a, we're feeling a significant impact on this. So it would be helpful to have that kind of in infrastructure, not just on meth, because if the infrastructure is set up properly, then it can respond quickly. Part of the, part of the frustration for all of us on the map is without that kind of infrastructure, there was a lot of crisis management going. When we were working with states on state legislation, mostly people were not coming to us in a preventive mode with the exception of the last year. They were coming to us in a crisis mode saying, we've got 1,400 labs, we've got to do something. If there had been a proper infrastructure in place to do the kind of early warning that you're suggesting, somebody would have known in advance, wait a minute, it's impacting law enforcement, foster care placements, county budgets, treatment admissions, communities and schools. None of us had that information available to us. We didn't have anybody saying that to us. It was because we all decided to coordinate with each other and say, well, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing? That's how we figured it out. And one of the frustrations for us is that early on, we were trying to work with state and local legislatures, part of who was just looking at usage numbers saying, well, you know, really, this isn't a problem, is ONDCP. I thank you all for your, your comments. One of the uh, things that, uh, I mean, because ultimately this is what ONDCP is supposed to be doing. Uh, and the question is, is that why aren't they? Is it structural or is it individual or is it both? To the degree it's structural, um, 
we passed our House version, the Senate is moving it, but as we move to conference, maybe we can look at, is there a way to build in a uh, structural way uh, to get the kind of input into the ONDCP reauthorization? Individuals change the structure, uh, outlast the individuals, and we need to uh, look at how to, how to work some of these big questions uh, uh, through as we're working the HIDAs, as we're working the community anti-drug coalitions. But then part of it is is that we've got things in multiple agencies, DOJ, uh, Safe and Drug-Free Schools is over in education, treatments in HHS, uh, <clears throat> and how that was the, why we created Drugs R's office, uh, was to try to at least influence and coordinate the information uh, as these things are in, in multiple agencies. Uh, it has been <clears throat> pretty frustrating to me that uh, Department of Justice clearly has been involved in meth longer uh, and at the grassroots, and yet members of Congress um, basically, and I don't know how many hearings I had, it was like, why wouldn't the administration just come out and say that they were involved? It was like pulling teeth, and I think part of it is is that I'm not even sure the Department of Justice was aware at the grassroots how involved their local DEA agents were in the task forces, how involved their, their what exactly was being done with their grants. They were anti-drug grants, and then in the communities, when they started dealing with it, it was meth, and the information was just seeping back to Washington that they were up to their eyeballs in meth, and they didn't know it. But what it meant was we didn't have any cohesion mm -hmm. to trying to address what was overwhelming at, at the grassroots. And I think uh, your input here has been helpful. We appreciate that. We'll have this continuing uh, dialogue. Uh, we have a couple more field hearings coming up uh, yet this uh, summer. And um, uh, thank you once again. Anybody have any closing comment you would like to make? Then with that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Jobs. Up here on C-SPAN 3, separation of powers in light of the FBI raid on a congressman's office, then ideas on how to increase